Monica stopped caring about Finn, she figured he would leave on his own after he readjusted his emotions in a while anyway. In fact, she did not have to worry about him getting hurt. Even if he did, he could protect himself. With that, she lifted the blanket and went to the bathroom without any clothes on her. At first, she was drunk and groggy, so she could still sleep. However, now that she was awake, she would feel very uncomfortable with the smell of alcohol. Hence, she went to take a shower, and by the time she came out of the shower, Finn might have left. As the sound of the shower came from the bathroom, Finn's eyes were fixed on the bathroom. However, he wanted to leave, so he turned around and left. Just like all the times he had had a conflict with Monica, he would instinctively choose to protect himself, and leaving now would be the best way to protect himself. After all, Monica had explained everything clearly, and she did not love him that much. However, he suddenly stopped walking. Even though he knew that he was hurt, he did not want to protect himself. Instead, he wanted to get Monica. He even realized that he could not accept what Monica said about her not loving him. He could not accept that she saved him because she did not want to live anymore and wanted to return what she owed him. He was really panicking. For the first time in their relationship, he felt nervous and afraid. No matter how many times they quarreled and broke up, deep down, he knew how Monica felt about him. However, this was the only time he felt that Monica was not lying. He did not think that Monica was doing this to attract his attention. The current Monica was different from the Monica of the past, so she would not be childish enough to test him with such a thing. She knew very well that once she said that, their relationship would be over. Yet, she said it, she had abandoned their relationship. Finn suppressed his emotions, but deep down, he was starting to break down. He had never thought that the fact that Monica did not love him would be a huge blow to him. No matter how hard he forced himself to accept it, he could not accept it. He was still standing at the door of Monica's room, motionless, when Monica came out of the shower with a towel casually wrapped around her body. As she did not expect Finn to still be here, she furrowed her brows. Not only was she surprised, but there was also a hint of annoyance in her eyes. She looked as if she did not want to see him again. Finn could read her emotions clearly. Aren't you going to leave? Monica asked him. Even though she had sobered up, she felt much better now. The difference between her and others was that no matter how much she drank, as long as she rested, she would be full of energy. That was why she usually did not resist getting drunk. It's late, Monica urged again when she did not get Finn's reply. We're all going to Edward and Candace's wedding tomorrow. I don't think it's good to be late to a wedding of that level. Monica reminded him. She wanted to wake Finn up from his trance. In fact, Finn did not look like he had lost his mind. However, the fact that he did not leave exposed how oddly he was behaving. The usual Finn would have slammed the door and left. He definitely would not stand there and do nothing after all that she had said. Thinking that Finn did not hear her, Monica bit her lip. She then glanced at the alarm clock on the bedside table and saw that it was already 2 a.m. Would they be able to get some sleep tonight? At least, she wanted to get some sleep. She had reached the age where she needed to take good care of herself and did not want to stay up late. Hence, at that moment, she walked up to Finn and pulled him with her hand. Since talking was useless, she chose to act it out. The moment Finn saw what she was doing, he had a slight reaction. She said, let's go. She was really chasing him away. I'm going to rest. You can leave, mm. Monica was stunned. At that moment, Finn suddenly held her body and kissed her fervently. It was so fervent that Monica could not bring herself to react for a few seconds. All she felt was Finn suddenly hugging her tightly, and he was so strong that she could not resist at all. Then, she felt him bite her lips rudely, like he was taking revenge on her. Ugh! Monica twisted her body. She stammered as she tried to push Finn away. She did not expect to provoke him so much that he would lose control tonight. In her opinion, Finn would never do such a thing. Even if he felt uncomfortable at that moment, he would endure it and would never vent it on anyone else. That was why she was caught off guard. However, it was too late to take precautions now. Finn's strength was astonishing, and that was something Monica had known many years ago. If Finn did anything to her or even killed her, she would not be able to escape. Her resistance seemed to have agitated Finn even more. Finn, who had been suppressing himself for the entire night, finally exploded. He hugged Monica and pressed her onto the bed. The bath towel on her body was useless. Even without Finn doing anything, it had slipped off during the confrontation. She bit down hard on Finn's mouth. She had used so much strength that she even tasted blood, but to Finn, it was nothing. 
since he could not feel pain at all, it was useless for her to bite him. She just suddenly felt uncomfortable because of Finn's violent and crazy behavior, and tears were flowing down from the corners of her eyes. What happened to them parting on good terms? Now, Finn was going to consume every last bit of feelings she had for him. She suddenly chose to endure Finn's madness. She wondered if Finn was just venting his anger because she said she did not love him. If it was, she would compensate him for one night for lying to him all these years. Although she was fine with it, it was still unbearable. It was so unbearable that her tears never stopped flowing down her cheeks. Finn saw it but ignored it and vented all his anger on her. After venting, he did not leave. Instead, he pressed down on her body. By then, both of them had quieted down, and everything was silent. It was as if they were not even breathing, like they were just two empty shells. After some time, Finn finally got up from her body. Was that enough? Monica asked him. Finn's heart ached because of Monica's emotionless voice. Tonight, he had lost control and wanted to use a method he despised the most to prove his existence in Monica's life. He knew she knew her rejection and discomfort, but he did not stop. If it's not enough, you can continue, Monica said calmly and coldly. Finn wanted to apologize, but he held it in. After all, what was the use of apologizing? He had done it, so what else could he apologize for? Until you are satisfied. Finn's throat moved slightly, and he clenched his fists tightly. However, he did not do anything to Monica. Monica waited for a while. After confirming that Finn would not do it again, she said, since you're not interested, leave. She was urging him to leave again because she just wanted to push him away. I'll let it go this time. Monica said, but next time, I will see you for rape. With that, Monica left Finn's side to take a shower and wash away all the smell on Finn's body. Just as she got up from the bed, Finn suddenly said, Monica, I never agreed on the breakup. It was rare for him to speak. She had always felt that with Finn's personality, he would not say a word even if he was beaten to death. He would not mention anything about his loss of control tonight and would treat it as a thing of the past because his pride would not allow it. Monica's eyes flickered as she turned around and looked at him. I never agreed. Finn met Monica's gaze and spoke seriously. Monica wanted to laugh because she thought she had just heard the funniest joke in the world. What did he mean by he never agreed to the breakup? Was he silently admitting that she had left because he was watching her put on an act? She said, being together is a matter between two people but breaking up can be one-sided. Monica chose not to argue with him because she did not want to waste any more of her time on it. She did not want to try to figure out Finn's thoughts either. Whether it was because his pride could not take it or, something else, that was his business. From the moment she decided to break up, it had nothing to do with her. No Finn immediately disagreed with her. A relationship is between two people. It's not up to one person to decide. Monica looked at him coldly. It was a look of disgust. In her heart, he had probably become a filthy existence for having forced her to have sex. Just as Monica was about to speak, Finn got up from the bed. As he put on his clothes, he said, after Edward and Candace's wedding, I'll come and pick you up. Ha! Huh. Monica laughed out loud. She did not expect herself to be able to laugh at that point. Finn quickly put on his clothes and left. She told asked him to leave so many times tonight, but he did not. Yet now, he was leaving just like that. Did he feel embarrassed? Would a man with such strong self-esteem feel uncomfortable because he had done such a disgusting thing? Monica turned around and walked into the bathroom. To be honest, Finn's skills were not great, so he had not hurt her that badly. That be asterisk starred. She cursed that he would be killed by a car when he went out. Of course, curses were nothing but bullsh asterisk t. Finn did not die. In fact, he was alive and well because she saw him in his suit at Edward and Candace's wedding. When Finn left her bed, it was around 3 a.m. It would have been 4 a.m. by the time he went home to wash up and sleep. He had to accompany Edward to get married early in the morning, so they would probably gather at 6 a.m., which meant that they would have had to wake up at 5 a.m. Therefore, he had rested for an hour at most, and an hour would be enough for him to be in high spirits, unlike her. She did not know how much foundation she had used or how long she had put on makeup to make herself look a little less haggard. Her eyes flickered. In fact, she was not looking at Finn. As to the matter of Finn forcing her to have sex, she would take it as Finn reacting poorly to reality because he could not accept it at that moment. Anyway, she had slept with Finn so many times, so one more time was nothing. She was not bothered about her so-called chastity anyway. 
Of course, she did not take Finn's words about bringing her back to the house and that they had not broken up seriously. She believed that Finn was just trying to find a reasonable excuse for his actions. After all, Finn was a good doctor with excellent morale. Doing that kind of thing was blasphemy to him, so he had to think of a way to excuse himself. Her current focus or, to be precise, everyone's attention was on Edward and Candace. At that moment, in the grandest banquet hall of Harkin, Edward and Candace were walking on the long red carpet in the middle of the hall, with all the guests who were attending the ceremony sitting on both sides. Accompanied by a majestic symphony, the two of them slowly walked over. Monica looked at the newlyweds in front of her. The entire hall was filled with cameras, presenting their wedding scene seamlessly to everyone in Harkin. If not for Edward and Candace's peerless beauty, the regal and overly solemn wedding would have made everyone think that it was a state banquet and not a wedding. The atmosphere of the ceremony was also very stiff. There was nothing romantic about it, nor were there any touching vows. Instead, they made a promise to each other about their contributions to the country, promising to devote their life to the country after marriage. After the solemn ceremony ended, the banquet was held next to the ceremonial hall. It was a typical wedding, and everyone sat quietly in their seats. No one whispered to each other as if they were here for a meal and not to congratulate the newlyweds. Due to that, Monica felt inexplicably better. At least Edward had poured all his heart into his wedding with Jean, and no one could compare to him. It was the wedding of the leader of Harkin, and with the blessings of the people of the country, the ceremony was completed. Candace followed Edward back to Bamboo Garden. She had expected today's wedding to be like that, following the rules. However, when she really experienced it, she felt a little disappointed. From the beginning to the end of the wedding, there was no anticipation at all. She was actually, holding on to a little bit of hope. Last night, she received a call from Edward in the middle of the night. He said that he had just returned from drinking with his friends. She had always thought of Edward as the kind of person who was aloof and out of touch with the world. After all, he was the leader of the Harkin, and his status was high. However, when he called her last night, she vaguely felt that he was like most men. In private, he lived like everyone else and also had a bachelor party. His expectations for marriage and love were not as indifferent as she had imagined. Moreover, he was unlike what the rumors said about him using women for the sake of his political career. It seemed like the more she interacted with Edward, the more she found him to be different from the rumors. The two of them did not talk for long. It was as if they were also holding in what they really felt. After all, they had only known each other for a month. During that month, Edward was very busy, and they could count the number of times they saw each other. Hence, the two of them were not very familiar with each other, and as such, they kept a lot of their feelings to themselves. Before he hung up the phone, she heard Edward say, Candace, I'll bring you home with me tomorrow. The word home made Candace's heart pound. She even felt a little uneasy. It was as if there was something stuck in her heart, like a bad memory. She could not recall it in her mind, but her body would instinctively remember, so the uneasiness would translate to her body. However, she had to admit that she was touched by Edward's words. That sentence made her feel that Edward really liked her and that Edward's marriage with her was not just a formality. After all, their relationship was a typical political marriage. Early that morning, Edward's wedding convoy arrived at the Nicholson's residence. Everyone was respectful when Edward appeared to pick her up before he left with her. The festive atmosphere was everywhere, but the people who were getting married and those attending the wedding did not dare to do anything inappropriate. Needless to say, the wedding venue was even more impressive. The form was more important than anything else. Candace even felt that under so many cameras, she and Edward barely exchanged glances. The two of them had been working hard to maintain their best state from the beginning to the end. They could not let themselves make any mistakes in front of the entire country. Fortunately, it was finally over. When she got into Edward's car, the camera finally disappeared in front of them, and she could relax. Candace watched as the car stopped at Bamboo Garden. She had stayed here for a night before, but did she really have to stay here forever from now on? Her heartbeat was racing because he suddenly thought of something, tonight was the wedding night. The overly solemn wedding ceremony today had made her forget that there was a more important part of the wedding besides the ceremony. She bit her lip lightly. The moment the car door opened, she was about to get out of the car when a certain someone suddenly picked her up. Candace's heart skipped a beat, and she looked at Edward, watching as he suddenly lifted her up. It made her blush and her heart race. However, she hugged his neck shyly and allowed him to carry her quietly into the living room of Bamboo Garden, 
which was filled with wedding decorations. It was also not too late in the night now. After all, as the leader of Harkon, it was impossible for him to greet the guests personally, and they could leave only after the banquet ended. Then, there would be someone to pick up the guests who came to attend the wedding. Therefore, it was only past 8 p.m. at most. At that time, neither the two children nor Teddy would be asleep. However, there was no one in the house. Even Edward's personal guards were left outside the living room of Bamboo Garden. It felt as if tonight really belonged to the two of them. Candace tried to calm her heartbeat. Then, Edward carried her into their wedding room. Even the huge room was filled with flowers for the occasion, which made it feel like a wedding, especially at that moment. Edward carried her and placed her on the big bed. The luxurious wedding dress on her body seemed to blend in with the color of the bedsheets. She could tell that Edward had put a lot of effort into certain details. Even if he did not say anything, maybe he still felt bad. After all, today's wedding ceremony was so boring that no woman would have any expectations for it. After Edward placed her on the bed, she did not leave, nor did he let go of her body. Instead, he leaned over and kept very close to her. As the ceremony was held in front of the entire country and so many ministers, there was no so-called intimacy. Throughout the entire wedding, they had limited opportunities to even hold hands. Not to mention, the groom would kiss the bride at a traditional wedding. At that moment, Edward's face was getting closer and closer. Candace gripped the bedsheets tightly. Finally, she started to get nervous. She was so nervous that the moment Edward approached her lips, she used her hand to cover her lips, and Edward's kiss landed on the back of her hand. It was a gentle tap, and their eyes met. For some reason, it was a little awkward. Anyway, Candace was embarrassed. Tonight was supposed to be. She did not know what she was being reserved about. At that moment, she even instinctively rejected his approach. She said, Can I take a shower first? The moment she said that, her face turned red again. However, she thought she saw a smile in Edward's eyes. He said, All right. His voice was a little hoarse. When he got up from her body, Candace sat up from the bed. They had clearly agreed to take a shower, but the two of them seemed to be in a deadlock. Candace thought about many things. She wondered if she should shower first or if he should shower first. After all, there was only one bathroom, and they could not shower together. Candace's face turned red. Then, she heard Edward say, You can shower first. All right. Candace did not refuse. She got off the bed and went straight to the bathroom. Wait a minute. Edward suddenly pulled her back. Candace turned around and looked at Edward. Her heart was beating wildly. After all, it was the bridal chamber, and any woman would be shy. I'll help you take off your wedding dress, Edward said. Candace's face was as red as a tomato. Taking your wedding dress off yourself is not easy, Edward explained. Candace braced herself and nodded silently. As Edward started to unbutton her, Candace's heart was beating really fast. She stood in the middle of the room, surrounded by Edward's aura. The powerful aura made her afraid to move for even a second, and her body seemed to be trembling a little. Are you afraid? Edward asked her. In the quiet room, Edward's words scared Candace so badly that she jumped. Edward's smile widened at her reaction. His magnetic voice seemed to carry a hint of affection as he said, Don't be afraid. She was not afraid, she was just nervous. However, she bit her lip and did not answer. By then, Edward had unbuttoned her wedding gown. The white wedding gown slid off her shoulders, and when it was on her chest, Candace held on to it. She said, I can take it off myself. Edward smiled and looked at Candace who was holding on to her clothes and running away. Then, when the bathroom door closed, the smile on his face gradually stiffened. He actually was not as calm as he appeared to be. He had been suppressing his emotions, waiting for her, for more than three years to finally return to his side. His throat moved slightly, and he walked out of their room. When Candace came out of the shower, she saw that Edward had already changed into a sapphire blue bathrobe and was sitting on the sofa in the room. He was looking at his phone, waiting for her. In fact, she had showered as fast as she could. She thought that since Edward still needed to take a shower, she did not want to take up too much time in the bathroom. Unexpectedly, he had already taken a shower in another room. At that moment, Edward, who had taken a shower and taken off his luxurious suit, seemed much more approachable. The bathrobe was casually tied around his body, revealing a large part of his chest. His hair was also much softer after the shower. There were even some short strands that covered his forehead. He looked completely different from the slicked-back hairstyle he presented himself to outsiders. 
The man with the slicked back hair gave people the impression that he was meticulous, extremely serious, and even a little too cold. Yet now, with his casual, soft hair, she suddenly felt a sense of familiarity with him. He did not feel as distant as when she first saw him, especially due to the difference in status. When she came out, Edward shifted her gaze from her phone to her. She had removed her wedding dress, removed the makeup on her face, and let go of the bun on her hair. At that moment, her hair was damp from being just washed and not blown thoroughly enough. The moist sensuality started from a strand of her hair that fell on her sexy collarbone. Edward gulped. Moreover, she was wearing a pink bathrobe, which was a couple's outfit. The bathrobe was also loose and soft on her body. Where her skin was exposed, it was so fair and tender, that it tempted him. Edward put down his phone and walked toward Candace, who was still in the room. Candace looked at his tall body as he stood in front of her. She had taken off her high heels, so the difference in height between them was unusually obvious. She even felt that in front of him, she was so small that it was scary. Her heart was beating faster again, and it went crazy as she felt Edward's large hand hold her small hand. With their fingers interlocked and their palms filled with their warmth, Edward brought her to the bedside. After sitting down, other than the fact that their palms were tightly clasped together, no one took the initiative. Edward did not take the initiative to approach her, and of course, she would not take the initiative. All she could feel was that her heart was about to jump out of her chest. What did she say about not feeling anything in her heart? When she was with Edward, she clearly felt it beating aggressively, but she still calmed her heartbeat and waited. However, the person beside her did not seem much calmer than her. She could vaguely feel that his hand that was holding hers was trembling slightly. Did that mean, he was nervous too? Or, was it something else? Candace really had no idea, but there was something that made her want to understand. Hence, she turned her head, wanting to see the expression on his face. At that moment, Edward suddenly lowered his head and leaned over. Initially, he just wanted to kiss her cheek, but because of her actions, their lips pressed together tightly. Candace froze, and Edward, too, was surprised. At such a close distance, the two of them just looked at each other with their eyes wide open and did not do anything. Candace's fingers were tied into a knot on her clothes, which showed how nervous she was. In fact, she had mentally prepared herself, yet she still did not know what to do at that moment. What she did not understand was, with Edward's experience in marriage and his understanding of the affairs between men and women, should he not be able to handle it with ease. However, his current behavior made her feel that he was even more nervous than she was. He was so nervous that he did not know what to do. It even made her wonder how Edward had his two children. While she was deep in her thoughts, she suddenly felt Edward's lips gently exerting some strength on hers, closing the distance between them. Just as his lips began to force her lips open and deepen the kiss, Candace suddenly dodged and pulled away. The moment she pulled away, she could still see Edward's sexy lips slightly open. The next second, his eyes were filled with disappointment. It was maybe because he did not expect her to dodge, so he could not control the emotions in his eyes. Usually, Edward would not be so emotional as his status did not allow him to be. The moment Candace pulled back, Edward did not force her, nor was he angry. He just looked at her silently. Instead, Candace felt a little guilty. It was as if she had stopped Edward from doing what he really wanted to do. It was as if she killed his happiness. She bit her lip lightly. She wanted to explain, but she could not seem to say it. It was just their first night as a married couple, and she did not know what she was doing. She was prepared to sleep with him, but at that moment, she wanted to escape. The temperature in the room was slowly cooling down, and no one spoke. Candace could barely hold on in the tense atmosphere. Just as she was about to speak, she heard Edward say, I won't force you. Stunned, Candace turned to look at Edward. Seeing that Edward had finally regained his composure and gained control of his emotions, he said calmly, We still have a long way to go. He also said it jokingly to give her a way out. It was to ease her embarrassment and the guilt in her heart. Candace bit her lip and chose to remain silent. Edward said, You can sleep in this room, and I'll sleep in the next. When Candace looked at him again, the disappointment in his eyes was gone, and there was no sign of anger on his face. He was not angry because of her rejection. He said, Good night. After that, he got up, and just as he was about to leave, someone tugged on his clothes. Edward was slightly startled and he stared straight at Candace. It was as if he was trying to confirm what she meant and whether it was what he understood. Was it? His Adam's apple bobbed. Candace said, don't go. Edward could feel that his heart was beating uncontrollably. 
I can do it, Candace said, with her entire face and neck flushed red. Was she really that shy? At that moment, Edward was shocked, and his tightly clenched fists were turning white at the knuckles. Since we're married, we're husband and wife. On the night of the wedding, we should go to bed as husband and wife. Candace lowered her eyes and said quietly. She really did not dare to look at Edward's face. If she did, she would find out that Edward's current appearance was even more unsettled than hers. After she finished speaking, she did not receive a reply from Edward for a long time. It had been a long time since he received a reply from Edward, who had not left but did not approach her either. The moment she thought that she was overthinking things, she heard Edward say, Will you regret it? Regret? Why would she regret it? Since she had decided to marry him, she would really marry him. She had never thought of running away halfway. Before she could answer, she felt Edward's broad body hugging her tightly in his embrace. His body suddenly tensed up. It was clearly a little painful, but more than that, she felt the sense of security he gave her. It was very assuring. Even if you regret it, you can't go back on your word, Edward said. Candace's heart was racing. Because this is my limit. He could not control himself anymore and let go of her, pushing her onto the bed. Under the light, Edward's deep eyes were filled with desire and affection. That was when she started to feel a little frightened by his appearance. She even had a feeling that he would devour her whole. Her body was under his body. Oh. His hot lips kissed hers. It was completely different from the feeling when they gently touched each other just now. This time, he was so determined that there was no room for resistance. That night, the moon shone brightly outside the window. The next day, Candace opened her eyes tiredly. She had finally seen the difference between men and women, which was huge. Not only was there a difference in their body structure but also, many things. After one night, she was so tired that she did not even want to move her toes. Yet, he could go on all night. Candace recalled the scene from last night, and her face turned red. The relationship between a man and a woman that she thought of was completely different from the relationship between a man and a woman that she had actually experienced. It was, completely different. As she moved her body, it felt as if she had been crushed by thousands of mountains, and she did not have any strength left. It made her wonder how long the man beside her had held it in for, considering how crazy he went on their first night. At that moment, she could not even move. Even if her entire body was sore and she just wanted to lie there forever. Therefore, she simply stopped struggling and looked at the man sleeping next to her. At that moment, he was still sound asleep. She figured that it was getting late, so logically speaking, he should already be at work. Supposedly, he did not rest for 365 days a year. For the sake of the Harkon, he would give his all until he died. She could not imagine how much a person could sacrifice for a great cause. She just looked at the man who had been sacrificing himself and looked at his relaxed brows. Somehow, there seemed to be a look of satisfaction on his face. Was he satisfied with everything that happened last night? Candace blushed but did not look away. She was really happy to see such a handsome face the moment she opened her eyes. It was a kind of yearning for beautiful things, but she also could not help herself. Unconsciously, her fingers moved closer to his cheek. She was just curious how God could create a person to be so beautiful. Was he not afraid that the world would question his favoritism? Her fingers gently traced the outline of his face. Then, she caressed his facial features, bit by bit, as if, she had missed him a lot. She caressed his sharp eyebrows, high nose bridge, and, his perfect lips. Those alluring lips had really given her a lot last night. That was when she realized that not only a man would be tempted by lust. In fact, women could also be seduced. Instinctively, she took the initiative to kiss his lips, and after the kiss, she wanted to leave. However, her eyes widened. Oh. At that moment, she saw a certain someone suddenly open his eyes. It was clear that he did not just wake up because his eyes were clear and deep, filled with desire. She could not be familiar with that gaze. Last night, the whole night. Oh. Candace's body tensed up. She knew what Edward wanted to do at that moment. After one night, she had learned all of his moves. Hence, she tried her best to push him away. Alas, Edward had pinned her down. I don't want to. Candace refused. Edward's eyes were still burning with desire. I thought you were unsatisfied, my wife. His voice was clearly extremely low. My wife? After a whole night of sex, he had changed the way he addressed her that morning. However, Candace had no time to think about that because right now, she had to guard against Edward's, desires. She quickly said, I'm satisfied. 
there was no unsatisfied desire. She just wanted to touch his beautiful features just now, and there was no other, meaning to it. My wife, are you reassuring me of my performance last night? Edward chuckled with a deadly charming grin. Were all men so confident? It seems like you're not satisfied. Edward came to a conclusion when he did not get an answer from Candace, and the result of that conclusion was. I'm satisfied, Candace quickly said loudly. I'm very satisfied. Edward smiled again, but this time, he could not control his laughter. Candace felt like she was being bullied by the man. Thank you for your compliment, my wife. A certain someone's face was clearly filled with pride. I will continue to work hard. He was the dignified leader of a country, yet he was actually so indecent. She really wanted to let the entire country see how flirty their leader was. Are you hungry? Edward asked. He was in such a good mood that he hugged her tightly in his arms. Under the blanket, the two people still had their hands to themselves. What time is it? Candace asked. Edward reached for his phone and glanced at it. 11 a.m. It's so late. Candace was surprised. Her biological alarm clock was usually at 7 a.m. Thank you for your last night, my wife. Could he stop talking? Are you hungry? Edward asked again. I'm not hungry. Do you want to get up? Edward continued to ask. I don't want to move. In that case, I'll lie here with you. Just like that, he had no intention of getting up. Don't you have to go to work? Candace asked. From now on, I will sleep in. Therefore, was she the femme fatale? Candace lay in Edward's arms, and her entire body was soft as he hugged her. Neither of them spoke as the wind blew the curtains, allowing sunlight to shine through the gaps, illuminating the peace in the room. Was that what people meant by time passing by peacefully? Candace suddenly had a feeling that she would be here forever. She really wanted to lie quietly on the bed and stay by that man's side until the end of time. She realized that, at the end of the day, she liked him. It did not take much time, and they had only met a few times, yet she had fallen in love with Edward so easily. Was it because he was too charming, or was it because she fell in love too easily? She did not think that those were important anymore because even in a political marriage, love could exist. However, she did not know if she should feel lucky it happened. Outside the room, a young girl's voice suddenly rang out, and it was accompanied by the knocking on the door. Daddy, are you sleeping in? It was Paige. Candace moved instinctively and wanted to get up. Even though she wanted time to freeze and forever stay at that most perfect moment of her life, because of Paige's appearance, her peace was disrupted. She did not know if Edward had that magical power or if it was in all of Edward's genes, but anyone related to Edward could have a huge impact on her life. Candace was about to get up when someone hugged her even tighter, obviously stopping her from getting up. It was as if, he missed the fact that they could hug each other so quietly without anyone disturbing them. It's Paige. Candace reminded him. She knew he loved his daughter very much and that he would grant all her requests. However, at that moment, he was indifferent to Paige's shout and even deliberately ignored her. The man on the bed was really an asterisk shoal. When she thought of Paige's pitiful little face guarding the door, she could not bear it, yet he could ignore it. Just as Candace was feeling all sorts of guilt, she heard Teddy's voice from outside the door. Paige, why are you here? I'm here to wake Daddy up, Paige answered. Your dad and mom are still sleeping. Can you not disturb them? Teddy coaxed her gently. But Daddy and Mommy have been asleep for so long. I want them to accompany me. Paige was obviously unhappy. They're very tired from last night. That's why they've been sleeping for so long. Let them rest for a while more, okay? Why are they so tired? Paige asked curiously. Uh, Teddy, who was outside the door, was put in a difficult position. He probably did not know how to answer. Teddy, why are Daddy and Mommy so tired? What did they do last night? It was a child's nature to be more curious the more he did not answer. Doing, adult things. What is it? Many things. You'll know when you grow up. Teddy played dumb. He really did not know how to explain it to a three-year-old child. However, now that he said it out loud, he felt extremely awkward. His face was flushed red. Is it about making babies? Paige seemed to have suddenly thought of something, and the moment she said it, her soft and sweet voice was filled with excitement. Teddy was stunned. What he could not say, Paige blurted out. It was originally a simple explanation, but he made it sound so complicated. Teddy nodded. Yes, it's about making babies. Am I going to be an elder sister? Paige was very excited. Teddy was speechless. How was he supposed to answer that? Isn't that right, Teddy? When Paige did not get an answer, she asked him again seriously. 
that'll depend on whether your father works hard enough, Teddy explained. Can I be a sister only if daddy works hard? Paige asked innocently. I guess so, Teddy said awkwardly. He was at a loss as to how to explain that to a three-year-old child. In that case, I must make daddy work harder. I want to have a younger sister tomorrow, Paige said firmly. Not even a rocket ship could take her to the moon by tomorrow. Teddy, let's not disturb mommy and daddy from giving me a sister. Paige suddenly understood the situation. She even left very enthusiastically. After they left, it was quiet outside and inside. It was so quiet that Candace felt like crawling into a hole in the ground when she heard Teddy and Paige's childish conversation. Giving her a younger sister. Candace bit her lip. For the first time, she thought that the suggestion was not bad. As she lay in Edward's embrace, her face was completely red. Growl. Suddenly, someone's stomach began to growl. Candace's face turned even redder, and she looked up awkwardly to see the smile on Edward's gentle face, which was filled with affection. If she had not interacted with the man, it was really hard to imagine that he, in private, would be as warm as the sun. It was completely different from the temperament and aura he gave off. She even had a feeling that he had given all his warmth to the most important person in his life and did not hold back. That was why he was so cold and indifferent to outsiders. Are you hungry? Edward asked her. That was right. Her stomach was growling. She was still a little hungry as she had not eaten much yesterday. It was not that she did not have time to eat, but she just did not have much of an appetite. She did not know if it was excitement or. She could not figure it out either. After all, the wedding yesterday did not bring her much anticipation. However, what happened yesterday was something she would never forget. After all, it meant that she had one more person in her life from now on, and perhaps it was the man who would be with her for the rest of her life. She bit her lip lightly and did not speak. Edward did not make her feel awkward. Instead, he let go of her body reluctantly. He said, I'll find you something to eat. No need. Candace pulled him back. Edward looked at her. Let's get up together. She did not want others to think that she was lying in bed on the first day and letting others serve her. Thinking back to the conversation between Teddy and Paige just now, she felt that it would be very awkward. Are you sure? Edward asked and looked at her strangely. Candace frowned and nodded. As such, Edward did not refuse. He got up and picked up the bathrobes, which they had thrown on the floor last night because they went crazy. He put it on himself first and then on Candace. Although he was behaving sincerely, she was still shy by his actions. Once they had put on their clothes, Edward went down first. After that, Candace lifted the blanket and got off the bed. Just as her feet touched the floor, Candace's body went limp, and she fell to the ground without any warning. It was embarrassing, but what was even more embarrassing was, her legs were so weak that she had no strength left. Last night was clearly too much for her. However, it was in that awkward situation that she heard someone's uncontrollable laughter, mocking her. Her face was flushed red with embarrassment, but she was exasperated. She looked up at Edward, looking at him looking down at her from above. He seemed to be in a good mood as he watched her fall to the ground. He said, I told you to lie down and I'll do it. Candace glared at him, looking displeased. Oh, don't misunderstand. I didn't mean last night, Edward hurriedly explained. It would be best if he had not explained himself, because the moment he did that. Did he want her to live at all? She really did not dare to think about last night. Edward looked at Candace's expression, and the smile in his eyes became even more obvious. Then, he bent down, picked Candace up from the floor, and placed her back on the soft bed. Candace could not understand. They were all humans, and although he had it harder last night, why did they wake up the next day feeling different? Why did she wish she was dead while he was full of energy? After Edward placed Candace on the bed, he left the room for a while and brought back a bowl of eggs on toast. The fragrant smell of the eggs gave her more of an appetite. She even felt that at that moment, her mouth was watering. She gulped and watched as Edward sat in front of her with the plate of eggs on toast. He asked, Do you like toast? Candace nodded. She really loved Southampton City's eggs on toast. In the month that she had returned from overseas, she would have it from time to time. However, Edward seemed to have known about that fact long ago. He picked up the toast for her and placed it by her mouth. I can do it myself. Candace was still a little embarrassed. She was an adult, and neither was she missing an arm or a leg. I was afraid you'd be too weak. I'm not, Candace retorted. If you're not weak, you wouldn't have fallen on your face just now. You should have been the one to fall on your face instead, Candace thought. 
As if he could read Candace's mind, Edward smiled and coaxed Candace, be good. Open your mouth. Candace looked at Edward and how determined he was, so she opened her mouth obediently. She could not believe she was so easily bewitched by the man. She ate the toast that Edward fed her, and it was really delicious. Having been fed the delicious food, she decided not to forgive him. The room was filled with love. Candace finished it all in one go. In the end, only the crust and crumbs were left on the plate. Edward asked, was it delicious? Yes. Candace nodded. In fact, she did not expect herself to have such a big appetite and finish all the eggs on toast. It was shocking. Do you still want more? Candace shook her head as she felt very full from eating. If she ate more, she would gain another two pounds. In that case, I'll eat it, Edward said bluntly. Candace was shocked, but she watched as Edward ate the crusts and crumbs. For some reason, she felt a little emotional. She did not expect Edward to be so comfortable with her. Nothing much was left on the plate, and there was her saliva on the food. Edward finished her food and then looked at Candace, to whom he said, As expected, you didn't leave much for me. You didn't say you wanted any. I thought you wouldn't be able to finish such a huge portion. Was he blaming her now? It's all right. Edward looked forgiving. I like raising pigs. You're the pig. That's why my children are called George and Page One. Candace was speechless. Sleep a little longer. Edward placed the plate at the side of the bed and crawled into the bed. Candace was stunned as Edward hugged her body tightly. However, she had to admit that she had eaten too much and was really sleepy again. No. It was definitely because she was too tired from last night. She would never admit that she was like a pig, who ate, sleep, and repeat. The two of them hugged each other tightly again, and everything was perfect. In the room, Candace suddenly said, Edward. Yes. Edward smiled. Every time he heard her call him by his name, she could see the bright smile in his eyes. I didn't bleed, Candace said. Although it was awkward, she wanted to explain it to him. When Edward left earlier, she had rummaged through the bed sheets and did not find any blood. She thought that she had overlooked it because of how intense last night was, but when she looked carefully just now, there was nothing. Edward hugged her even tighter. Do you mind? Candace asked. She did not know if the man would care about that. All she could tell him was, in my memory, you're the only man I've slept with. I know. Edward muttered, I know everything about you. Huh? Candace was surprised. I've always been the only man you've slept with, Edward told her with certainty. Was that so? Perhaps he was, but anyway, she could not remember. In fact, it could be because she had grown up in the army and received a lot of difficult training, which tore her hymen. Be good and sleep. Edward coaxed her. Candace fell asleep in his arms. Even though she had slept the entire morning, she fell asleep again very quickly. The moment she fell asleep, she seemed to hear Edward mumble softly in her ear. Did he say genie or was it just an illusion? The news of Edward and Candace's wedding was still occupying the headlines of all major news sections the next day, and it was still trending. Monica threw her phone aside. She did not want to read the news about the two of them, but she could not control herself and read it. She was very unhappy when she saw everyone blessing the newlyweds. F asterisk CK. She felt that if she continued reading it, she would become enraged. With that, she lifted the blanket and got up from the bed. It was quite satisfying to sleep until late in the morning. After all, she had not slept well the night before and had attended a wedding the entire day yesterday. To be able to sleep so soundly last night was incredible, and she felt revived. Feeling refreshed, she washed her face and came out of the bedroom in her pajamas. It was a rare weekend, and she wondered whether she should go back to the Cardellini family's residence to spend time with her parents. After all, it was quite lonely for the two elders were lonely at home. At that thought, her body suddenly froze, and her eyes widened. Was she hallucinating? Why was Finn at her house? That was her own apartment, not the place where she and Finn used to live together. How did he get in? Moreover, he was in her kitchen, cooking. She froze for a few seconds, and after that, she asked him, Why are you here? I came early in the morning. I saw that you were sleeping soundly, so I didn't want to disturb you. How did you get in? Did she ask him what time he arrived? I walked in. Finn. I sent you back the night before last, so I saw the password you entered and remembered it, Finn explained calmly. Damn it. It seemed like she had to change the password. However, that was not the main point. The main point was, what are you doing here? I told you that I'd come and bring you home after Edward's wedding. Monica sneered. She thought Finn was joking. She looked at him coldly, but Finn pretended not to see it. 
he said, lunch will be ready soon. She knew that it was lunch time, but when did she agree to have lunch with him at her house? She said, you can eat. I'm going back to my parents' place. They're on a vacation, Finn said bluntly. What? Why did she not know that they had gone on a long vacation again? They told me a few days ago, and I even did a full-body checkup on your father. He's fine, so he can go out and have some fun, Finn said. Monica was a little angry. She could not believe that the couple would tell Finn where they were going instead of their own daughter. No matter what, she felt a little upset. Get a knife and fork for me, Finn told her to do something for him very naturally. Monica instinctively wanted to help, but she held herself back. She said, I don't have an appetite. If you want to eat, you can have it yourself. After saying that, Monica turned around, went back to her room, and locked the door. The sound of the lock clicking was loud and clear. Finn looked at the two stakes he had made, and finally, he could not hide the panic under his calm appearance. He had thought about the calmest way he could use to pretend that nothing had happened between them and bring her back. However, her rejection was obvious. He also felt very distant from her, like she really did not love him that much. His throat moved slightly. Monica probably did not know or, to be precise, he did not know either how much of an impact that sentence had on him. Whenever he thought about it, he felt like he was suffocating. Despite that, he placed the steak on the dining table. Then, he found a knife and fork and put them on the table. After he prepared everything, he knocked on Monica's door. However, no one answered the door. Finn said, you can sleep after you eat. If you don't eat breakfast or lunch, you could have gastric issues. There was still no answer from inside the room. Monica, listen to me, Finn called out to her patiently. Monica still did not respond. I'll wait for you. In the end, Finn had no choice but to compromise and wait. He waited until the door suddenly opened. The moment it opened, he saw that Monica had put on light makeup and gotten dressed. It was obvious that she was ready to go out. Finn swallowed the words that he was about to say. Once you've eaten, pack up and leave. When you leave, close the door for me. Monica said as she walked towards the main entrance, I'll change the password when I come back tonight. Having made herself clear, Monica walked straight to the door. She opened the door, and just as she was about to leave, the door closed with a bang. Monica looked at the tightly shut door and turned around to look at Finn with a frown. The disgust was visible on her face. We'll go out after lunch, Finn said firmly. Why should I? Monica asked, why should I eat it just because you want me to? I told you, we didn't break up. Only you think that. Monica said sarcastically, to me, we're already strangers. At most, you're just my family's doctor. Monica, let's talk. There's nothing to talk about. Monica was very cold toward him. I've said everything that needs to be said, and I don't want to hear what you have to say, so let's not waste anyone's time. I know I wasn't good enough in the past. I didn't care about what you felt, and I ignored your feelings. However, I will try my best to change in the future. I will try my best to spend more time with you in the future. Just then, Monica's phone rang, and she picked up the call immediately. Finn's words did not affect her at all. Since he wanted her to listen to him, she would. Then, she would probably leave after he finished speaking. Without wasting a second, she answered the call. Brandon. Are you ready? I was just about to leave. I'll be downstairs in about five minutes. All right. I'll wait for you. Finn suddenly snatched the phone away, and Monica's face sank. Finn said into the phone, you don't have to come. Without waiting for Brandon to react, he hung up the phone. Monica looked at Finn coldly and watched as he held her phone very tightly. She did not know if all men could not accept a breakup because even someone like Finn could not accept it. She really thought that her breakup with Finn would be just like how they had done countless times before, where Finn could let go of her when he wanted to. Hence, she did not expect him to take it that far this time. She could not deny that it disgusted her. Since the night before, when he had forced himself on her, she felt a strong sense of rejection toward Finn's series of reactions no matter how hard she tried to convince herself otherwise. It was the same at that moment. However, she controlled her emotions and said in the calmest voice, give me back my phone. Let's eat first. Finn was able to compose himself in an instant. At that moment, there was no anger in his voice. Give me back my phone. Monica was losing her patience. I'll return it to you after lunch. Finn. Monica's throat moved slightly as she said, do you want me to hate you? Go on, Finn said bluntly. Monica sneered. So this is what you meant when said you'll change? Change it to someone disgusting? 
Actually, she did not expect things to be so tense between her and Finn. However, when a person was angry, they would really say hurtful words. That was an instinctive form of self-protection. Between you leaving me or hating me, I will choose the second option, Finn said coldly. Why are you so insistent that I stay? Monica asked him. She really did not understand why he was so insistent that she stayed. If he did not have any feelings for her, he would just accept it calmly. Why would he make things difficult for each other? I love you, Finn suddenly said. Monica's heart skipped a beat. She looked at him and saw how serious he had become. I love you more than you think, Finn repeated and enunciated each word. Monica was shocked and she probably thought she had misheard. How could Finn say something like that so easily? How was she supposed to answer him now? That is why I won't let you leave me, Finn said with certainty. Then, he took the initiative to hold her hand, but Monica suddenly dodged, rejecting his approach. She could not believe it. How much did Finn love her? Maybe his love was different from what love meant to ordinary people, and it meant he only liked her a little. How much could he love her? She did not dare to easily have her feelings for him again. After so many years, a heart that could be broken had long turned cold. Why could he not learn his lesson? She said, Finn, I don't love you anymore. Finn's eyes were red. I don't want to love you anymore, Monica said sincerely. She had actually tried when she had just reconciled with Finn. She, too, wanted to try and see if they should start over. However, it failed. Finn's heart was not that easy to warm up. Just like hers now, it could not be warmed up anymore. Sometimes, when one was tired of a relationship, one would really let go. She did not know if Finn had used the same method to let her go back then. Maybe it was not. After all, she was the one who broke Finn's heart back then, and Finn chose to let go. She looked at Finn in front of her and his bloodshot eyes. In fact, she had thought about breaking up many times. She had thought about it from the very beginning. Was it right for them to be together like that? After they got back together and slept together for the first time, she actually wanted to break up with him. She thought that if it did not work out, she would break up with him as soon as possible. However, she did not expect that she would sleep with him. She did not know what kind of mentality she had when she slept with Finn, but when they slept together, she thought that she might be able to get by. She always had hope for their relationship, but she was always disappointed. Finn would not remember her birthday, so they would not do anything romantic. They did not even go out as a couple and enjoyed a candlelight dinner. For a long time, all Monica could remember was them sleeping together. She had actually tried to change things up in the relationship. She thought that since Finn could not take the initiative, she should take the initiative. In any case, one of them in the relationship had to put in more effort than the other. Therefore, she would ask her secretary to remind her of important holidays when she was very busy. For example, for Finn's birthday, she would cancel all her dinner plans, buy a cake, and wait for him at home. However, he had never celebrated with her once because there were always emergencies in the hospital. She did not know if their relationship was not strong enough or if it was fate playing tricks on them. In any case, every year on his birthday, she would be alone with the cake, and after midnight, she would throw it into the trash can. For a period of time, she would also take the initiative to call Finn. However, Finn was always busy. In fact, she knew that he was very busy. During that time, the hospital he worked in was establishing a public hospital specialized in cardiology, so there were a lot of materials to prepare and a lot of tests to be done. She knew that other than him, many other people in the hospital were busy with that. Hence, she should sympathize with him and support his dedication to medicine. She should become a good wife, just like the family members of all the other medical staff in the hospital. However, she was not that benevolent. The fuse of her complete disappointment in him. The trigger to her disappointment in him was when she had appendicitis. At home, she was in so much pain that she felt like all her organs were twisted. The moment she thought she was going to die, she used all her strength to call Finn. However, his assistant answered the call. She said Finn had to take an emergency for a patient who was having a heart attack that night, so he was in the operating theater and could not answer her call for the time being. It really was not Finn's fault, but she gave up on Finn then. Perhaps it was very willful of her to behave like that. If she said it out loud, everyone would think that she was being insensible. After all, Finn was saving lives, and she had no right to stop him from doing such a great thing. However, she was tired of it. Later, she called the ambulance herself. She did not dare to alert her parents as she was afraid that her father's heart attack would relapse again. 
When the ambulance arrived at the house, she really felt like she, or more precisely, her heart, had died a thousand times. After she was sent to the hospital, she went for an emergency appendectomy. The surgery went smoothly, but she needed to stay in the hospital for a few days. Finn only came to visit her on the third day of her hospitalization. She was not even excited, even though she saw the guilt and worry on his face. He explained that he had to stay in the hospital for two nights because of an emergency, so he did not know that she was sick and hospitalized. That was right. They only cared about each other when they met face to face. Sometimes, he even forgot that there was a communication tool, called a cell phone. She really did not blame Finn, and it was not his fault. Since he was so busy, what could she blame him for? He just took many things too lightly. After she was discharged from the hospital, Finn treated her well for a while and did not work overtime, which was rare. On the contrary, she came back later and later. No matter how late it was, Finn would always wait for her to go to bed, but he never asked her why she was back so late. Who was she socializing with at night? He actually did not care about her day, what she encountered, or who she was with. He just waited for her every night, probably to fulfill his responsibility as a man. In that relationship, he had to bear the responsibility because he felt that he owed her one. In fact, there was no such thing as owing anyone anything. Back then, she had risked her life for him. The more she thought about it, the more she felt that it was because she had depression and did not want to live anymore. Before she died, she wanted to repay him for saving her life, and they were considered even. At that time, she really did not have much feelings for him. If Finn had not suddenly said to start over, she might have told him the real reason long ago. She was not sure if she was possessed, but she agreed to get back together with him. Perhaps it was her discontent about how their relationship, which they had missed again and again from the beginning, ended. Now, she was satisfied because she finally realized that she had no expectations, and there was no need to have any expectations for what Finn was saying now. She said, Goodbye, Finn. It was not that they would not see each other again, but the relationship they had been in for nearly ten years had ended. Monica did not tell Finn to return her phone. She just turned around, opened the door, and left. Despite that, her eyes turned red. After all, it had been so many years, and humans were not animals, so how could she not have any emotions? However, it was all right. She suddenly had a feeling that she had let go of everything, and she felt very relaxed. It felt like a huge load had been taken off her chest. From now on, she no longer had to force herself to live in the past. She had just walked out when Finn reached out to pull her back. She had let go, but he had not. Why should she leave when he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her again? Why was she not so determined to leave when he thought he had no feelings for her? Why did she have to do it now? The moment he thought they could start over, she chose to turn around and leave. As he stretched out his hand, Monica avoided it as if she had expected him to do that. The moment she avoided Finn, she saw Brandon panting at the door. He had probably run to her house, worried about her after hearing Finn's voice. At that moment, it was obvious that there was some conflict between them. Therefore, Brandon pulled Monica behind him and stood in front of Monica to confront Finn. Finn looked at Brandon with an ugly expression and clenched his fists, wanting to hit someone. He had never lost control of himself like that before. What did you do to Monica? Brandon questioned Finn. Finn's expression was cold, and he was clenching his fists so hard that his knuckles turned white. Since you and Monica have broken up, stop bothering her, Brandon said fiercely. After saying that, he dragged Monica with him to leave the place. Let go, Finn said coldly. Brandon, who was dragging Monica away, stopped in his tracks for a moment. However, in the next second, he left with Monica and did not take Finn seriously. He had only taken a few steps when his body suddenly tensed. It was because Finn was pulling on his arm, on which the hand happened to be holding Monica. As Finn was very strong, Brandon felt like his arm was going to be crushed. However, he did not let go of Monica. It was a stalemate. Finn, that's enough. Monica knew how strong Finn's grip was. By then, Brandon's face had turned red. What do you want? Can't we part on good terms? Do you have to embarrass us like this? Monica shouted at Finn. At that moment, she pushed Finn's hand away as if she had gone mad. However, the harder she tried, the tighter Finn's grip was. Brandon endured the pain in his arm until his fingers were trembling. I told you to let him go. Monica was furious. Get him to let go of you first. Finn said. No. Brandon gritted his teeth. Even if it kills me, I will never let go of Monica's hand again. 
Brandon, let go. Monica really did not want the two of them to argue over her, she wanted Brandon to compromise. No, Brandon said firmly, when I was young, I couldn't resist because I didn't have the right to make my own choices. But now that I've grown up, I will never let go of you again. I will never let you be defiled by a man like this. Stop talking. Monica really did not want to anger Finn at that moment. No matter what their relationship was, saying such words at a time like that would only provoke Finn, and she did not want to kill anyone just yet. She said, let go of me, both of you. Let go. Neither of the two men compromised. In fact, Monica could see that Finn's grip was getting tighter and tighter. He was using so much strength that Brandon's face had turned from red to pale. She was really afraid that Brandon's hand would be crippled if the situation went on. Hence, she tried her best to control her emotions and said to Finn, Finn, what do you want? What do you want from me? Does your heart ache for him that much? Finn asked. His voice was very cold. It's been so many years. Isn't it enough? Can't you see how unsuitable we are for each other? How badly do you want us to hurt each other? How should I tell you so that you'll know that I risked my life for you and got into a car accident because I was depressed? I don't need you to take responsibility at all. Even if it's your responsibility, three years are enough to call it even. We're done. Monica's emotions that she could not suppress anymore erupted. Finn's throat moved up and down. Back then, I pursued you because I was young and insensible. I didn't know we would bring so much harm to each other because of the difference in our upbringing. I didn't know that falling in love with you at sight for you back then and my impulsiveness would cause so many sad things to happen between us. If I knew, I would never have taken the initiative to get close to you. I would never pursue you like a madman. If there was a next life, I would definitely stay far away from you. I would definitely avoid you. Were your feelings for me just on a whim? Finn asked her coldly. From the looks of it now, it seems like it. Monica gave an affirmative answer. The maliciousness in Finn's eyes was obvious. We're not from the same world. We were wrong for each other from the beginning. My living environment, my pursuits, your living environment, your pursuits. We have nothing in common. I used to think that love could change everything and break all odds, but only now do I realize that love would only make me more stupid. Finn, I've really had enough of this relationship. I haven't had enough. Finn suddenly lost control of his voice. He even sounded like he was going mad. If you've had enough fun, that's your problem, but I haven't had enough. Finn, can you not be so mean? Monica looked at him with reddened eyes, when I chose to leave you to help Michael, how did I treat you? I didn't think we would break up at first, but in the end, I let you go. I accepted that you didn't love me and endured everything. Why can't you let go of me when you clearly don't love me? I love you. I don't believe it. Monica insisted. She did not believe that Finn loved her. Perhaps Finn had no idea what love was. He did not love Patsy or Sarah, and it was the same for her. Now, he was just too selfish to accept that the woman who had been by his side for so many years wanted to leave. Finn, you will always love yourself the most. You don't know how to love others at all. Monica accused Finn, and I don't have the ability to make you fall in love with me. Finn's eyes were red. What Monica said made him, uncomfortable. He thought that his relationship with Monica had stabilized. After being together for so many years, they were finally back together. They were living together and could see each other every day, and he thought that was eternity. Monica, on the other hand, felt that he did not love her. In fact, she did not think he knew what love was. As he hesitated, his Adam's apple bobbed. He was constantly trying to suppress his emotions. Monica was also trying her best to calm herself down. She said, Finn, I've lost hope over the past three years. There were many things that she did not want to say. However, she suddenly felt that if she did not make things clear, Finn might not be willing to break up with her. She said, I started over with you not because I loved you very much, but because I thought I still loved you and that our relationship could be revived. But, I didn't. In the past three years, everything I've experienced with you has made me lose all hope not only in relationships but in love. I've wasted my love on you for so many years that I'm afraid of falling in love again. I'm really afraid that one day, I'll suffer from depression again, but I can't die. Finn, can you let us and our relationship go so that we can both live the life we deserve? Finn kept staring at Monica with cruelty, coldness, and pain in his eyes. There were so many emotions that Monica could not understand. However, at that moment, she felt a little glad. After so many years, she finally saw the mix of emotions in Finn's eyes. She had always thought that he was a cold-blooded animal without any emotions. 
to him, nothing else but social responsibility existed, he was living without a soul. Where did she get the courage to think that she could make a soulless man fall in love with her? They looked at each other, and Finn suddenly let go of Brandon's hand, which was numb from the pain. I didn't know I'd been such a failure in the past three years. Finn said in a cold voice, in the three years we were together, not only did I not take good care of you, but I also made you lose all hope in love and almost made you suffer from depression. Monica really did not want to argue with Finn. She was really so tired that she really did not want to waste any more energy on that relationship. That was why she had to cut off all their feelings for each other and all possibilities for reconciliation. Brandon, let's go, Monica called out to Brandon. What do I have to do to make you feel that I love you? Finn called out to her. Monica sneered and replied, if you really love me, you don't have to do anything. Therefore, how much of a failure was he to love a woman to the point where he was willing to die for her, but made her feel that he did not love her at all? Finn, you really don't have a heart, Monica said resolutely. She thought she heard Finn chuckle, but it also seemed like an illusion. Do I have to dig out my heart for you to see it? he asked with bloodshot eyes. Monica felt a sharp pain in her heart. She really did not know why Finn would suddenly act so radically. She had never thought that Finn would become so agitated because of the breakup. On the contrary, she thought that Finn would remain calm and accept their departure indifferently. Her vision was getting blurry. She did not dare to try again. Even though she could feel that Finn was different from usual, as if he had fallen in love, she really did not dare to accept his love so easily. How many years could a woman give a man? She was afraid if she held on for another ten more years, she would really lose herself in the relationship. Without saying anything else, she turned around and left with the coldest attitude, ignoring all his feelings and leaving with another man. The two of them walked into the elevator together, and the moment the elevator closed, Finn reached out to block it. Monica looked at him while holding herself back. He looked like he was really injured this time. However, she had no idea why Finn was so persistent this time. What was it that he could not let go of? He was clearly a cold-blooded person, and every time they broke up, his life was great. Monica, give me some time. I'll prove it to you, Finn pleaded. He was acting so humble that Monica's tears fell uncontrollably. She did not need Finn to treat her like that. In fact, she did not want to owe anyone anything. Whether it was the past or now, no matter how she had changed her conscience would not allow her to owe anyone. She said, Finn, what's the point? Why did they have to make each other so sad? I can't lose you, Finn said. He was telling her the truth. He really could not lose her this time, or he did now know what would become of him. Would he become numb to everything? Would he lose all hope of the world? He did not know. All he knew was that he really did not want her to leave, he did not want them to become strangers. Don't leave me. Even if we want to break up, we should think about it carefully and give each other some time to adapt. Finn was begging her humbly. He was begging her to give him some time to adapt even though it would mean that they broke up. However, that was just an excuse to make her stay, no matter how despicable the method was. Still, he was wrong to think that Monica loved him and that he could get her back if she let her leave. As long as he took the initiative and Monica saw his sincerity, they could reconcile. However, only now did he realize that he was wrong. Monica did not believe that he was sincere and would not give him the chance to take the initiative to reconcile. She had really let it go, and he was very familiar with letting go of someone. That year, when Monica abandoned him, he also felt the same. If not for the fact that Monica almost died for him, he would never give himself the chance to accept her. Then, they would never be in each other's lives anymore and would drift further and further apart. You don't need time. Monica's eyes were blurred with tears, but her voice was calm. Finn looked at her and saw the tears streaming down her face, but there was no trace of sadness on her face. It was as if, tears were not a product of sadness but a natural reaction of the body. She said, you don't need time. You'll do just fine. She, on the other hand, needed a lot of time to let go of her feelings for Finn. She admitted that she was very selfish as she had been ready to break up with Finn for almost a year now. Although she had spent a year forgetting about Finn, she did not tell Finn about it nor did she let him prepare to break up with her like she did. That was because she knew Finn could take good care of himself and that he would do just fine. Finn. Monica said, I hope that the next woman in your life will make you understand what love is. There won't be another one. Monica's eyes flickered. You're the only one in my life. Monica smiled and remained indifferent to Finn's confession. Her hard work over the past year of keeping herself indifferent to Finn was not in vain. She said, I won't be. 
she was certain that Finn would have another woman in his life. He might be alone for a long time, but when he felt lonely and needed a family, he would find a woman to build a family with him. He was very good at taking care of himself and he knew what was best for him, so she did not have to worry that he would not be doing well. She stretched out her hand and forcefully pried Finn's hand away from the elevator door. At that moment, the elevator was already ringing. It was a warning. She pried Finn's fingers apart, one by one. It was as if she was slowly cutting off her relationship with Finn. Finn watched as the elevator doors closed as if his entire world had been shut off, and a teardrop fell from his eyes. Inside the elevator, Monica's tears were streaming down her face, and she could not stop it. As expected, she was not as strong as she thought. She did not think that her long-planned breakup would hurt her so much. Do you want to go back? Brandon looked at Monica. In the beginning, he really thought that if Monica and Finn broke up, so be it. Since Finn did not love Monica that much and Monica did not love Finn that much, their relationship should have ended long ago. However, at that moment, he suddenly felt that that was not true. Finn loved Monica more than he thought, and Monica was not as heartless as she thought. No, Monica said. She did not want to repeat the same mistake again. She no longer wanted to hold on to any expectations or give herself any hope. She and Finn were over. Even if she missed him one day, she would never regret it. Monica left in Brandon's car, and in the car, no one spoke. Monica gradually regained control of her emotions during the ride. She had accepted the end of her relationship with Finn. In fact, she had gone over the scene many times so that when the day really came, she would feel okay about it. She watched as the car stopped at a clubhouse. She was at home when she received a call from Brandon. He said that the people he had been talking to about some international drug research and development technology were here in Southampton City and wanted to talk to her today. Naturally, she did not hesitate to go and discuss it. She did not tell Finn on purpose because she felt that there was no need for her to do so. She took a deep breath and wiped her tears away. She even put on light makeup on her face so that it did not look like she cried. She said, go buy me a cell phone and get me a SIM card. Then, come in and look for me. All right. Brandon agreed immediately. Monica tidied up her clothes. After making sure that she was dressed appropriately, she got out of the car and walked into the high-class clubhouse. Brandon stared at Monica's back and felt that she had become very powerful. She gave off a feeling that she was invincible. When they were young, she was still that little girl who loved to wheedle, cry, and rely on others. How much did she have to go through to become like that? Brandon went to buy a new phone for Monica and replaced her SIM card. She probably did not want to be involved with Finn anymore, so she would not go back to Finn to get her phone back. He did not know if Finn and Monica's breakup would give him a chance to woo Monica. However, since he had that opportunity, he would not allow himself to give it up. Monica had lunch with the international R&D technical director, and they talked until 4 p.m. before ending the business meeting happily. The result was naturally good as the R&D team would come to Cardellini Pharmaceutical next month and bring the advanced, foreign research and design technology to Harkin. Of course, Edward's support was also the reason the negotiations went so smoothly. In fact, Edward was the one who negotiated many of the international medical technology, and she was the one executing them most of the time. It was indeed to Edward's credit that Cardellini Enterprise could develop to its current peak. Hence, even though she hated that SC asterisk bag Edward to the core, she had no choice but to submit to his tyranny. That was what it meant to take advantage of others. After the negotiation, Brandon drove away. Where are we heading back to? Brandon asked. Monica looked out of the window and said calmly, let's go back to the company. Boss, are you going to work overtime? Why not? Brandon smiled and drove the car to Cardellini Enterprise. After arriving at the Cardellini's, Brandon followed Monica into the company. You don't have to work overtime, Monica said. That won't do. If my boss works overtime and I don't, how will my boss see my hard work? Brandon deliberately said, the unspoken rule of the workplace is that we work for our boss to see. Monica smiled faintly, which meant she tacitly agreed. Moreover, there were some things that she needed Brandon to do. If she gave him the task today, all the employees could get to it when they came to work tomorrow. She sat in her office and said to Brandon, this international research and development team will come to the company next month to conduct research and development. There are some specific matters that needed to be settled. I'll give you the overall plan now, and you can go and sort out the necessary arrangements. All right. Brandon nodded. 
When it came to work-related matters, both of them would be very serious. The two of them talked for almost two hours. Monica said, if you have any problems, you can look for me directly. We can't make any mistakes with the research. I know. It's getting late, so you can get off work after you're done. What about you? Brandon asked. I want some time alone. Brandon naturally knew why Monica wanted to be alone. She probably wanted to have some time to think about her and Finn. After all, her relationship was over, and she still needed some time to adjust. In that case, I'll go out. Brandon stood up from his seat and did not ask any more questions. Most of the time, he would put himself in Monica's shoes. He did not want to make things difficult for her or scare her too weakly. The moment he left, Monica suddenly said, Brandon, don't send me flowers anymore. He saw the bouquet of flowers in the room that had been withering for two days. Brandon was stunned. Since when did he send her flowers? I'm not thinking about dating right now, so whatever you do won't affect me too much. At that moment, Monica had placed her attention on her computer screen and said lightly, when I really want to start a new relationship and you happen to be single, I will let you know. What she meant was, do not bother me now. Brandon looked at Monica's expression, and in the end, he said, I didn't send you the flowers. Monica's hand that was on the keyboard paused. This unoriginal way of picking up girls is not my style. Monica pursed her lips. It might be Finn, Brandon said bluntly. He wanted to win her over openly, so he did not have to be afraid of anyone. You may leave. Monica did not say anything else other than that. With that, Brandon nodded and left. After the office door closed, Monica finally looked away from the computer screen and looked at the bouquet of flowers placed beside her. Never in her dreams would she have thought that Finn would send her flowers. In fact, she had never thought about that possibility before. She reached out, pulled open a drawer at the side, and looked at the cards inside. Then, she casually took out one and looked at the handwritten words. She really could not recognize that it was Finn's writing. Therefore, it was not Finn's fault alone because she did not know much about Finn. That was why their relationship was a failure. Monica found all the cards and threw them away. She also threw away the bouquet of flowers that had yet to completely wither. It was not difficult to end a relationship. In Bamboo Garden, Candace really did lie in bed for the whole day and only got up when it was time for dinner. When she woke up, her back was still sore. She did not know if she had slept too much or slept too much the night before. She changed into a set of light pink lounge clothes and went downstairs. As she went downstairs, her legs were trembling. Edward, the man who had spent the entire day in bed with her, was currently walking down the stairs with her. He was smiling brightly as he watched her walk down the stairs. Candace glared at him. What are you laughing at? It's all because of you. Edward endured it. I'll be more careful next time. There will be no next time. Candace thought. Edward took the initiative to hold Candace's hand as they walked toward the living room, where George and Paige were watching TV on the sofa. It was obvious that they were watching a cartoon that Paige liked, and George was watching it with his sister. The moment Paige saw them coming downstairs, she quickly got off the sofa with her short legs and ran to them. She hugged Candace's calf and said, Mommy, you're finally awake. Candace felt a little embarrassed. Then, when she recalled the scene of Paige coming to look for them at noon, she squatted down and patted Paige's head. Yeah, Mommy, hold me. Paige stretched out her hand, and her big eyes were filled with anticipation. Just as Candace was about to pick up Paige, Edward suddenly picked Paige up. Daddy will hold you. No, I want mommy to hold me, Paige resisted. Children were born rebellious. You're as fat as a piglet. Mommy can't hold you. Well, Paige looked aggrieved. I'm not very fat. I'll do it. Candace really could not bear to see Paige's pitiful look. She felt as if her heart was being tugged by something and she wanted to give Paige the world. Your legs were shaking when you went downstairs. Are you sure you can hold her? Edward asked. Candace blushed again. What was he saying in front of the child? Edward held Paige and explained, Mommy can't carry anything too heavy now. Paige, you're no longer a baby, so Mommy can't hold you. Is Mommy pregnant? Paige asked innocently. Did a three-year-old girl really know everything? I just watched a cartoon that said that pregnant mothers can't carry heavy objects. Just now, Lily wanted her mother to carry him, but her Mommy rejected her. The so-called Lily was a character in the cartoon. No Edward said. Mommy worked too hard last night. I know. Daddy and Mommy worked so hard last night just to give me a younger sister. Daddy, am I going to be an elder sister soon? 
Paige asked happily. Edward was stumped by Paige's question. Daddy, can I see my sister tomorrow? Paige was so caught up in her own joy that she could not help herself but ask. Candace looked at Edward speechlessly for a long time. She wondered if that was what people meant by something would always conquer another. Fortunately, at that moment, Teddy walked over respectfully. Fourth master, madam, dinner is ready. Edward nodded and said to Candace, let's eat. Yes. The family walked to the dining table. The moment they walked over, Candace glanced at George, who was sitting on the sofa and did not participate in their conversation. He did not even look at them. George did not like her very much, and she could tell. However, it was understandable. Who would want their father to marry another woman? She followed Edward to the dining table. Although George did not like her, he was extremely well-mannered and would not lose his temper willfully. Hence, he sat quietly at the dining table. With that, the family ate dinner quietly. Daddy, I don't want to eat this green vegetable. At the dining table, only Paige's voice could be heard. Paige had a very generous character and lively personality, which was completely different from George's. Was it because George was 10 years old this year, so he was mature and sensible, or had he always been like that? Candace looked at the scene of Paige eating on Edward's lap and suddenly felt sorry for George. She felt that Edward had given all his love to Paige and seemed to be much colder to George. Of course, she also knew that George, as the leader's next successor, had to be nurtured differently. However, George was still a child, who needed companionship and love. Candace suddenly picked up a piece of potato and placed it on George's plate. George, who had been eating properly and with good manners, paused for a moment when he saw the potato in front of him and looked up at Candace. Candace said, you're a growing boy. Eat more. Actually, she had been carefully observing George and noticed that he liked potatoes, so she chose his favorite. The surprise in George's eyes slowly dimmed. At such a young age, he was very good at controlling his emotions. Thank you, he said politely. It was soft and distant. Candace smiled. Edward hugged Paige and looked at her and George, choosing to remain silent. At the dining table, Peggy's cute voice and Edward's doting voice could still be heard. Candace would also say a few words because the clever Paige would call out to her from time to time. Her heart would melt when she heard him call her mommy. However, George did not participate in their conversation from the beginning to the end, and neither did he eat the piece of potato Candace had placed on his plate. After dinner, Edward was playing with Paige in the living room. Candace accompanied Paige too, whereas George returned to his room early. Candace looked at George's back. While Edward was helping Paige pile up the wood, she said calmly, he needs some time. Even though Edward did not do much tonight, he still saw everything. Yeah. Candace nodded. In fact, she was fine. She was not even angry at George's coldness or deliberate rejection of her, but for some reason, her heart ached. Candace played with Paige for a while before Paige started yawning. Paige, time to go to bed. Edward reminded her. However, Paige was having a good time and did not want to go to sleep. Be good and go to bed early. You can still play with mommy tomorrow. Really? Paige's eyes sparkled like stars. It made people think that her world was full of colors. Of course, it's true. Won't mommy be as busy as daddy? Your mommy will stay home with you, Edward replied. Was Edward making arrangements for her life now? However, she was prepared to stay at home. As the leader's wife, she naturally could not go out often. Besides, she did not seem to have anything to do. The charity banquet that she held previously was to let everyone know about her so that her wedding with Edward would not be too abrupt. It was not to pave the way for her in the business world. The business world would be left to Chloe in the end. After all, it was the business of her mother's family, the Moors. Claire had always doted on Chloe, so it was impossible for Claire to leave the business world to her. That's great, Paige cheered. Candace smiled. Looking at how happy Paige was, she felt that it would not be too difficult to live with that little cutie. On the contrary, she was looking forward to it. Can we go back to the room and sleep now? Edward asked. Sure, but I want mommy to bathe me. I don't want Paula to bathe me. Paige made a request. Paula was a nanny who had accompanied Paige and taken care of him since she was young. It was said that she had been taking care of Paige since the latter was born and had always abided by her duties. Other than taking care of Paige, she did not have much of a presence in their lives. All right. Before Edward could reply, Candace agreed and picked Paige up from the ground. Paige giggled brightly. She kept saying, I love mommy. I love mommy the most. What kind of fate was it that made her and Paige hit it off so well? 
Candace carried Paige upstairs. Mom, aren't you pregnant? I thought you couldn't carry me? Paige's face was filled with worry. Candace smiled. It takes a long time to get pregnant. How long? Paige asked seriously. A long time. Even Candace did not know how long it would take. Some people could conceive overnight, but some might not even conceive for a year or two. Hence, she could not give Paige an accurate time. Is two days okay? Paige asked. She looked very serious. It was as if she was saying, if one day isn't enough, two days should be enough. Amused by Paige, Candace said, it's not a matter of one or two days. Three days. Paige said loudly, three days and no more. Candace was really blown away by little Paige's adorable expression. It was obvious that the little one had no patience to wait any longer. Therefore, she said, can't you give mommy a chance to spend more time with you? Paige blinked at Candace. With a sister, you'll definitely like to play with her more, but I want to play with you too. Candace tricked him. It was obvious that Paige had fallen for it. So, can you spend more time with mommy first and then have a sister after a while? Are you jealous, mommy? Paige asked. What did a three-year-old know about jealousy? Yes, I am. Candace smiled. Well, okay. Paige agreed with much difficulty. In that case, I don't want a sister for now. I'll play with mommy first. Okay. Candace kissed Paige on the cheek. She just could not help but kiss and be intimate with Paige, who hugged her back tightly. Then, the two of them walked into her and Edward's bedroom and went to take a shower. They were in a huge bathtub together. Children were naturally fond of bubbles, and Paige was playing with bubbles in the bathtub. Her little face was flushed red, and she was extremely cute. Mommy. After playing for a while, Paige suddenly looked at Candace's body and asked in surprise, why are you red and purple here? Candace blushed. How was she going to explain the marks on her body? It was the marks. Edward left behind last night. If she had known earlier, she would not have taken a bath with Paige. However, there was just something that made her want to get close to Paige. Did someone hit you, mommy? Paige's eyes turned red. The next second, she burst into tears and was crying heart-wrenchingly. Candace panicked. She finally understood that a child's mood could change easily with little things. One moment, everything was fine, and the skies were blue, then, a storm suddenly hit. The bathroom door was pushed open. Edward had clearly heard Paige's cries and rushed in. When Paige saw her father arrive, she quickly climbed out of the bathtub. Candace was originally planning to comfort Paige. However, with Paige gone, she was left, naked. She wanted to coax Paige, but she was naked. Paige's body was covered in foam as she threw himself into Edward's embrace. As she cried, she said, Mommy was bullied. Boo-hoo. Mommy was bullied by a big bad guy. Boo-hoo. She was crying so hard that she was heaving. Edward wrapped the towel around Paige's small body and coaxed her gently, There's no big bad guy? Daddy has chased away the big bad guy a long time ago. In that case, can you explain why Mom's body is covered in bruises? They're all injuries. Paige pointed at the marks on Candace's body. Coincidentally, there was one on her shoulder, and it was very obvious. Edward saw it immediately and understood that the big bad guy that Paige was talking about was himself. Hence, when his eyes met Candace's, he felt a little embarrassed. Then, he carried Paige out of the bathroom and coaxed her as he carried her away. Gradually, Candace could hear their voices getting further and further away. She did not know how Edward coaxed Paige but she did not waste any more time and planned to take a shower earlier. Just as she had finished showering, the bathroom door was pushed open again. Candace happened to be standing in the bathtub at the moment, preparing to come out, when, it became awkward. At the same time, a certain someone started to take off his clothes. Candace shrieked and retreated back into the bathtub. She looked at Edward's actions and asked nervously, What are you doing? I'm taking a shower, a certain someone said matter-of-factly. Why 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 you? you're taking a bath here? Why else would I take off my clothes? Wait for me to be done. When you're done, I won't need to shower. What a pervert. Candace thought to herself, but she asked, where's Paige? Candace quickly found a topic to talk about. She's fine. Paula is sleeping with Paige now. How did you explain to her about the big bad guy? Of course, Edward's tall body leaned closer to Candace. I told her the truth. Oh. Candace really thought that no one could match how flirtatious Edward was. The well-dressed man she usually saw on television. Well, she was blind before. After the two of them came out of the shower, Candace was a little thirsty and wanted to go downstairs to get some water. I'll get it for you. 
Edward pulled her back. No need. You should sleep early. Candace did not allow him to get up. You're starting work tomorrow, so you should sleep early. I'll go downstairs myself and see Paige on the way. Her heart still ached when she recalled Paige crying so sadly just now, and she did not know how Edward managed to coax Paige. With that, he walked out of the room and went to pour herself a glass of water first. Then, she walked into Paige's room. Paige had her own little princess bed, and there was another bed next to it, where Paula slept. The moment Paula saw Candace, she quickly got up. Paula, go to sleep. I'm just checking on Paige, Candace quickly said. All right, all right, Paula quickly replied respectfully. Candace walked to Paige's bedside. She looked at Paige's chubby, red face and saw her hugging a little white rabbit as she slept soundly. Her heart would melt because of Paige. She lowered her head and kissed Paige's forehead before touching her smooth and tender face again. Paige seemed to be having a good dream because, at that moment, she even grinned. It was so cute that Candace stared at Paige for a long time. After a while, George's figure suddenly appeared in her mind. Hence, she smoothened the covers for Paige, walked out of Paige's room, and gently closed the door behind her. Then, Candace hesitated for a moment before turning around and walking to the room next door. Just as she walked over, the door suddenly opened. It was not Paige who came out, but Teddy, who looked at Candace in surprise. Teddy was about to call out to her when Candace made a gesture to stop him from speaking. He understood and closed George's door. The moment he closed the door, she could see George sitting at his desk, studying. George was only 10 years old, and it was past 10 p.m. Did he need to work so hard? Candace and Teddy walked to the side. Madam, what's the matter? Teddy said respectfully. Does George study like this every day? Candace asked. Yes, young Master George has a lot to learn, so he goes to bed very late almost every night. Won't it affect his growth and development? Young Master George's growth and development will be checked regularly by experts. Nothing will go wrong. Nothing would go wrong? Who would treat their son like that? He was like a machine. As if he had read Candace's mind, Teddy said, Fourth Master has his own difficulties too. Of course, Candace knew about it. She just could not accept it emotionally. It's getting late. Madam, you should rest early, Teddy said respectfully. The moment Candace was about to leave, Teddy said, Oh right, madam. There's a parent-teacher conference at young Master George's school tomorrow. It's around 10 a.m. and it'll probably last until 12 p.m. I might not be around during that time, so if there's anything, you can call me. Therefore, had Teddy been attending George's parent-teacher conference? Therefore, had Teddy been attending George's parent-teacher conference? When Candace returned to her room, Edward was not asleep. As soon as she got on the bed, he held her in his arms. Candace, on the other hand, felt an inexplicable sense of repulsion. It was not that her body was repulsed by him, but she was a little resentful of him. She did not know why she would blame Edward for George. Clearly, the child was Edward's. Edward had a lot of things to deal with, so it was understandable that he could not take care of George. However, when she thought about how George had been alone all these years, dealing with his mother's death, his father's remarriage, and everything alone, her heart ached. What's wrong? Edward could sense her emotions. Even if it was just a little, he seemed to know. I think you care too little about George, Candace said bluntly. Her expression was quite serious, and it sounded like she was blaming him. Edward seemed to pause for a few seconds before he said, George is the next successor so his responsibilities are different from Paige's. George knows. So, the more sensible a child is, the less he will receive his parents' love and care. The less he cries, the less he will get their parents' attention, right? Edward was rendered speechless by Candace's words. Isn't George so sensible because he has experienced too much? Why don't you feel sorry for him? Why do you think it's natural? Candace questioned. Edward was still speechless. However, after a while, he said, because I grew up like this too. Candace swallowed the words that she was about to say. Edward said, I was like that too when I was young. Because I knew the responsibilities I had, I controlled my temper and got rid of my cowardice so as to make myself less expectant of the feelings around me and slowly made myself stronger and stronger. Candace could imagine a younger Edward in the same scene she saw George in just now, and her heart ached for him, her heart ached for both Edward and George. Born in such a family, they had everything from birth, but not the happiness of a normal family. Candace bit her lip lightly. At that moment, she did not know what else to say. 
It was Edward's child, so he should decide what education he wanted for him, and she should not have interfered. She just felt bad for the child, who had to bear everything since he was young, but in reality, there was nothing she could do to change that. Candace. In the darkness, Edward hugged Candace tightly in his arms. Candace wanted to hug George tightly because she thought George looked too lonely. The more a child did not want candy, the more her heart ached. I'll leave my children in your care, okay? Edward suddenly said. Candace looked at Edward, stunned. Edward said, I'm usually too busy, so I can't really care much about them. In fact, you said that I was cold to George, and I know it myself. However, due to time constraints, most of the time I can spare is given to Paige because she's still young. As for George, the only time I have left is to assess his growth. Candace listened quietly. At that moment, she could tell that Edward was explaining to her apologetically why he treated George like that. Candace did not know why Edward was apologizing to her, but all she could think about was, I'll help you take good care of George and Paige. She figured that might be Edward's biggest motive for remarrying anyway. Previously, she thought that Edward was only trying to get her father on his side. However, after interacting with him, she felt that Edward did not need anyone's help. Under his control, Harkin was indestructible, even though he had only been in office for two years. Therefore, his motive for remarrying was probably to have a complete family. She did not know why she had an illusion that Edward was not as strong as he looked. In fact, she felt that he was very lonely sometimes and that he, too, needed a warm embrace. The next day, when the sun had just risen, Edward woke up. Before he left, he could not help but plant a kiss on Candace's lips because he was reluctant to leave her. That kiss made Candace open her eyes in a daze. Edward. It's still early. Go back to sleep. Are you leaving? Candace asked. I'll be back tonight. All right. Although Candace was still unconscious, she was a little reluctant to part with him. Edward was reluctant too, but with great power comes great responsibility. Hence, he could only give himself one full day of private time and had to return to his responsibilities a day later. Candace rolled over and fell asleep again. She had slept too late last night. After chatting with Edward, she thought about many things. For example, since Edward had asked her to take care of George and Paige for him, she should really take good care of them. When Candace woke up again, she felt something on her face that made her itch. She opened her eyes only to see a young and cute face with pouting lips, which was kissing her at that moment. Candace's heart softened. Seeing how obedient Paige was, her heart almost melted. She hugged Paige. Good morning, Paige. Mom, you're awake. Paige was excited. Yes. So Snow White's story is true, Paige said happily. What story? It means that the prince can wake up the princess by kissing her. I just kissed you, and you really woke up, Paige said innocently. Candace could not help but laugh. In a child's world, everything was good. She sat up on the bed and stroked Paige's silky bob-cut hair. Thank you, Prince Paige, for kissing me and waking me up. I'll come and kiss you every day. Paige was even happier after being praised. All right. Candace agreed immediately. She did not even notice the doting tone and motherly care in her voice. It was as if it came naturally. Then, she lifted the blanket and got out of bed. When she went to the bathroom to wash up, there was a little tail following her closely. It was as if she would suddenly run away and Paige had to watch her closely. Once Candace had washed up, she went downstairs with Paige in her arms. Downstairs, Teddy had prepared breakfast. When he saw them appear together, he hurriedly went forward and said respectfully, Madam, you can eat breakfast now. Thank you. Candace was polite and sat down at the dining table with Paige in her arms. Teddy, what time does George usually go to school in the morning? Candace asked Teddy as she fed Paige breakfast. In her memory, she had never held a child before, let alone feed a child. Yet now, it was as if it was instinctive, and she did it with ease. She could also distract herself and chat with others. He has to get to school by 8 a.m. But the school isn't too far away, so we usually leave at 7.40 a.m., Teddy replied. What time does George get up? Because he studies till late at night, he won't get up too early in the morning. He'll wake up by 7 a.m. 7 a.m. was still quite early. Nevertheless, Candace remained calm and asked, Do you usually send him to school? I don't. George has a chauffeur to drop him off and pick him up. I only take care of his breakfast every morning. Candace nodded. Following that, Teddy looked at the time and said, Madam, you and Miss Page can take your time with breakfast. I have to prepare for George's parent-teacher conference. 
Are there a lot of things to prepare for the parent-teacher conference? Candace asked. Oh, no. Teddy quickly replied, there's no need to prepare anything for George's parent-teacher conference. The teachers are all very friendly to George. You can just sit there and wait to be praised. I just need to leave Bamboo Garden for two hours to do my task. That's good. Candace heaved a sigh of relief. She had never attended a parent-teacher conference, so she was afraid that she would not know anything. In that case, I'll go and get busy, Teddy said respectfully. Candace nodded. Mom, I'm full, Paige said loudly. Are you really full? Candace asked with a doting expression. Yes, I'm really full. As she spoke, she even puffed up her chubby little tummy. Seeing how cute Paige was, Candace said, Paige, can I discuss something with you? All right. Paige nodded obediently. She might not even know what it meant to discuss things and simply agreed. She said, I'm going to attend your brother's parent-teacher meeting later. Can I leave you alone for a while? You can't. Paige refused unhappily. Don't you love your brother, Paige? I do, Paige replied quickly. Your brother needs a mother now, so aren't you willing to share me with your brother? Feeling troubled, Paige did not answer. When your brother has something yummy or fun, does he share it with you? Candace asked. Yes, Paige answered honestly. So now, are you willing to share your mother with him? Paige thought for a moment before nodding obediently. Candace smiled. You're such a good girl, Paige. Paige smiled again at the compliment, looking really obedient. Then, Candace told Paige to play with the building blocks at the side while she finished her breakfast in a few bites. After breakfast, she played with Paige for a while until Paige's tutor arrived, and Paige went to class. Candace watched the interaction between Paige and the tutor and suddenly had a bold idea. However, she did not think that she would be able to convince Edward. She looked down at the time and left Paige's room to return to the bedroom, where she got changed. It was because of George's parent-teacher conference that she spent a long time seriously picking out what to wear. To her, it was a very important occasion, and she did not want to disappoint George. Once she got changed, she went downstairs from her room. At that moment, Teddy seemed to have finished all the chores at home. When he was about to go upstairs to get changed, he was surprised to see Candace appear in a slightly formal outfit. Are you going out, madam? I'm going to George's parent-teacher conference. Teddy was stunned. Can't I? Candace looked at his expression and felt a little awkward. No, no, I'm just a little surprised because, for so long, I've been attending them, Teddy quickly explained. Candace heaved a sigh of relief. She thought that George had specifically instructed that only Teddy was allowed to attend. At that moment, Teddy was a little too excited. He was probably touched by her wanting to go, so he said, it would be better if you could attend the parent-teacher conference for George in person. George has actually been looking forward to fourth master attending for so many years, but he has been disappointed every time. Now that you can replace fourth master, I believe George will be very touched. She could not guarantee that George would be touched. All she knew was that she wanted to treat George better. I'll prepare a car for you immediately. Teddy was very enthusiastic. He was afraid that she would suddenly go back on her word. All right. Candace nodded. I'll have to trouble you with Paige when I attend George's parent-teacher conference. No problem, madam. Teddy agreed. He was in a pretty good mood as he went to sort out the car arrangements. Then, he personally sent Candace to the car and even waved at her enthusiastically. Candace smiled faintly. Teddy kept defending Edward, saying that he was too busy to take care of George. However, deep down, he also hoped someone would care more about George. Her eyes flickered. The thought of attending the parent-teacher conference still made her inexplicably nervous. It was not long before the car stopped at the Angeberg International Elementary School where George was studying. Candace took a deep breath and walked into George's classroom under the guidance of the school staff. Then, she sat in George's seat. At that moment, all the students in George's class had gone to other classrooms to attend other classes, leaving only the parents and teachers in the classroom. When Candace appeared, everyone was shocked. The families that could attend Angeberg International Elementary School were either rich or noble, so naturally, they all knew Candace. However, no one took the initiative to go up and talk to her. Due to Edward's identity, there was still a sense of distance between them. Of course, Candace had her own concerns. Having become the leader's wife, she had to pay more attention to her words and actions. She sat quietly in George's seat. Then, she listened to the teacher on the podium talking about the students' learning that semester. Still, Candace was proud, 
because every time the teacher read out the names of the outstanding students, the name Elias Swan would be mentioned. Elias was George's real name. Even though many people still affectionately called him George, George had changed his name from George Lawrence to Elias Swan a long time ago. Edward could not be blamed for changing George's name. As the heir to the leader, it would not be appropriate for George to go with his maternal name. Sometimes, Candace wondered what kind of relationship George's mother had with him. Was it a relationship between friends? It should be. From the name, she could tell that his mother was unconventional. She silently listened to the teacher recite the name of the top student in the class, repeating Elias Swan like a recorder. In fact, Candace knew that the only person Edward loved was his first wife, Jean, and he only married Susan for political reasons. Although Jean was his only true love, Candace was not jealous. After all, Jean had passed away. She even felt sorry for Edward and Jean's relationship. After the teacher announced the overall results of the class, he talked a lot about the school's learning philosophy, learning plans, and many other things. In the end, the teacher said, Today, all the children have prepared a sentence for their parents. They have placed it in a pink or blue envelope inside the desk. Parents, please look for it. After saying that, all the parents were searching for the letter enthusiastically, including Candace. She searched for a while and found it. In fact, she felt that with George's personality, he might not have written something. After all, he had never thought that his father would attend the conference for him, let alone her. Candace opened the letter nervously, and there was a note inside. It said, Thank you, Teddy. Her eyes suddenly turned red, and a kind of sadness made her vision a little blurry. George was only a ten-year-old child. However, he had to endure the loneliness that many children of his age did not need to. She looked at George's handwriting, which was really good, and thought for a moment. Then, she found George's pen and wrote a sentence on the paper before putting the note back into the envelope and into George's drawer. When the parent-teacher conference ended, everyone left one after another. Candace, too, followed the crowd. Madam. Suddenly, someone called her from behind. Candace turned around. Seeing that it was George's class teacher, she smiled in a friendly manner. Thank you very much for coming to our class parent-teacher conference. You're welcome. It's what I should do. Candace said bluntly, Elias is our child, so of course, I have to attend. Yes. The teacher also quickly said, Elias is doing well in school. Madam, you don't have to worry too much. Thank you, teacher. Madam, take care. Candace nodded. She roughly knew why Edward never attended George's parent-teacher conference. Being busy was one aspect, but his status was another. When she attended the parent-teacher conference, she could already feel the teacher's and parents' wariness. If Edward really came, the entire school would probably be sealed off. Sometimes, it was not that Edward did not want to attend but that he had no choice. Candace walked out of the school gate and walked toward the car parked at the entrance. The chauffeur opened the car door for her. By then, George was already waiting in the back seat of the car. When he saw her, he was obviously a little surprised. He asked, Where's Teddy? He's at home. Were you here for the parent-teacher conference? George looked at her. Candace was already sitting beside George, and the chauffeur had driven away from the school. Yes. Candace nodded. I didn't tell you to attend, George said bluntly. It was clear that he was still rejecting her. I know. Candace said, but your dad has something on, and it's not convenient for him to come and attend it, so I have to do it. I didn't expect him to attend, but I didn't expect you to come either. In the future, Teddy can attend it for me. His tone was a little cold. You're my son. Isn't it natural for me to attend? Candace was inexplicably angry. It was just that George's rejection of her was too obvious. Understanding that he rejected her was one thing, but her feelings about it were another. I'm not your son, George said bluntly. Candace almost choked. Don't do anything unnecessary in the future, George said coldly. He looked cold and distant, which resembled the way Edward treated others outside. She said, George, whether you admit it or not, we will be a family in the future. It doesn't matter if you don't like it or if you don't accept it, but I'm your mother. Even if I'm not your biological mother, I'm your stepmother. There's no way to change that fact unless your father divorces me. Before the divorce, apart from your father, I'm your guardian, and you have no choice. George looked at Candace. He did not expect her to have so much to say. So, in order for us to get along better, I think we should make peace. I don't need to make peace with you. George refused again. It really broke her heart. If you want to win my father's favor, just take good care of my sister. 
George said, I'm not important. Candace was stunned. Did he say he was not important because he felt that his father did not love him? Candace's heart ached again. She said, your father is just too busy. That's why he doesn't have that much time to spend with you. I don't need his company, George said firmly. He was very mature at such a young age and did not have the nature of a child at all. It was as if he had thought through and understood everything. I'll keep you company from now on. Candace felt that she had a lot to say to George, such as Edward's helplessness. However, in the end, she felt that there was no point in explaining too much. What did George not know? He knew it, and that was why he acted like he did not care. Therefore, she told him directly that she would accompany him more. She would personally participate in all the things in his life that required her presence. At that moment, George was still a little stunned by Candace's words. I don't have much to do today anyway, so I have a lot of time to spend with you and your sister. I don't need it. George refused again. Candace thought to herself, why are children nowadays so hard to please? George and Paige were two extremes. No matter how she tried to be nice to George, he would always be cold and resistant to her. Yet, she did not even need to be nice to Paige, and the little girl would throw herself into her arms. Was that the difference between having a son and a daughter? No wonder so many people wanted to have a daughter. I don't like anyone getting close to me, George added. Candace expressed that she was a little hurt. She thought that George would be a little touched that she attended the parent-teacher conference today, but as expected, she was overthinking things. Everyone fell silent in the car, and suddenly, no one spoke. The car drove all the way back to Bamboo Garden. When Teddy saw them, he rushed forward enthusiastically. George, you're back. How was the parent-teacher conference today? Did the teacher praise him again? George glanced at Teddy and did not answer. However, Candace chimed in, yes, the teacher kept repeating George's name like a recorder. I knew it. Every time I attend the parent-teacher conference, I'm beaming with pride. Me, too, Candace agreed. Just like that, the two of them chatted happily. Of course, George would not get involved. Instead, he carried his bag and went upstairs. George, it's time for lunch, Teddy called out to him. Bring it up for me. I'll eat in my room. With that, he disappeared before their eyes. Teddy looked at Candace in confusion. What's up with him? He's not happy. Why? He didn't want me to attend the parent-teacher conference. Teddy was a little embarrassed. It's fine. Candace chuckled. We have to take things one step at a time. Teddy nodded and said seriously, George is cold on the outside but warm on the inside. I know. It was as if she knew George very well. Even when George was cold to her just now, she seemed to be able to feel that it was not because George hated her, but because he was afraid that someone would replace his mother. No one had ever told her about it. It was as if she had a special ability to know that George and his mother should have a really good relationship. Upstairs, in George's room, George sat in front of his desk in a daze, staring into space. He was biting his lips as if he did not want to think too much. He took out an old notebook from the drawer in his desk, which was left for him by his mother. No matter how much time had passed, no one could replace his mother. He could forget about his father, but he would never forget his mother. Candace was obviously trying to be nice to George, but George did not appreciate it. In fact, he was even starting to dislike Candace. Candace had a feeling that it was harder to please George than to please Edward. George was the kind of person who would not react to anything someone else did for him. He would not refuse or accept it just to protect himself. It made Candace curious. With George's personality, what would happen when he fell in love in the future? He would really break his mother's heart. Today, Candace woke up early as usual. Since George would get up at 7 a.m. for breakfast, she woke up at 6 a.m. to make breakfast for George. However, George was against it. When he saw that she was the one who made the breakfast, he did not touch his food and went straight to school instead. Seeing that, Candace could only get Teddy to bring breakfast to the dining table every day after she made breakfast. Then, she would return to her room without George noticing. That was why George mistakenly thought Teddy had made it and ate the breakfast. With George, Candace was extremely careful. By the time she returned to her bed, Edward was already getting ready to get up. Before he woke up, he would hug her and be intimate with her for a while. Who does George's character resemble? Candace could not help but ask. She thought George looked like Edward, but they were very different people. Edward was so, flirty. Ah. Edward bit Candace's ear. The two of them were, indescribable in bed. He's like me, Edward whispered into her ear with his deep voice. How is he like you?
Candace retorted, George is much harder to please than you. That's because he hasn't realized how good you are. I tried everything with him, Candace complained. In the past month, after being married and spending time together for a month, she was even more attentive to George than she was to Paige. After all, Paige was a healthy, growing child, and she just had to play with Paige and satisfy her needs. On the other hand, she had tried her best with George, but it was still to no avail. Take your time. Edward consoled her. Rather than he was comforting her, he was dodging the issue. Aren't you going to get up? Candace asked him. That guy was getting up later and later. However, Edward hugged her body, seemingly reluctant to part with her. Hurry up and get up, Candace urged. She did not want to become a femme fatale. Edward smiled helplessly. I just want to stay in bed with you forever. Candace blushed. In the past month since they got married, Edward had shocked Candace with a lot of the things he said, which he would never say to her when they first met. Sometimes, she even felt that the leader of a country was just an ordinary man and the flirtatious kind at that. All right, stop fooling around. At that moment, Edward was hugging Candace, with his lips on her neck, and it was really ticklish. Edward opened his mouth and bit her. Ow. Candace called out again. Was that guy a dog? After he was done, he got up from the bed in satisfaction. Candace also wanted to get up, but Edward stopped her. Sleep in a little longer, Edward said. Candace, who was lying under the blanket, looked at Edward. It's been tough. You should give yourself more rest. Edward's eyes were filled with love. Candace was speechless. What was so hard about staying at home every day? All she did was wake up early in the morning to make George breakfast which was not appreciated. How hard would it be? I meant at night, Edward added. Candace was speechless. She could never avoid him at night. With a red face, she snuggled under the blanket and watched Edward wash up and get changed. Then, as he did every day, he would give a kiss before he left reluctantly. Every time Candace saw the door close, she would still feel a little reluctant to part with him. It was just that, her relationship with Edward was like a storm. It came quickly and fiercely. She covered herself with the blanket and could still feel Edward's touch on her lips. She had to admit that Edward was really, strong. Other than when she was on her period, they could have sex every day. It was as if he had gone crazy from holding it in, so he was now trying to get back at her double. Candace's slender legs crossed, and she thought she could still feel some warmth there. Her face was a little red as she wondered whether she was pregnant. After all, she had not taken any precautions for the past month, and she should be on her period in the next two days. If it did not come, Candace's heart was racing. Although she had never mentioned to Edward whether they wanted to have more children, she was still a little worried. In Candace's heart, she had tacitly agreed that she would conceive. Besides, Paige was clamoring for a younger sister every day, and Edward did not refute it. Moreover, she really wanted to give Paige a sister. Candace thought about some things and fell asleep for a while. Usually, Paige would wake her up. The first thing Paige did when she woke up was to run to her room, crawl into her bed, and wake her up with a kiss. In fact, she would wake up every time Paige came, and because she did not want to disappoint the little girl, she played the same game with Paige every day. They would play in bed for a while before getting up together. Then, like a little tail, Paige would follow closely behind Candace. When she carried Paige to eat breakfast that day, Teddy seemed to have something to say but hesitated. Teddy, what's wrong? Candace could tell at a glance. Teddy endured it. George's birthday is soon. Candace was stunned. His tenth birthday, Teddy said. They had always said that George was ten years old, but it turned out that he was only about to turn ten. Are you planning a birthday party for George? Candace asked Teddy. I wish. But ever since George's mother passed away, George has stopped celebrating his birthday. Is that so? Candace's heart ached for George. And every year, George will leave Southampton City during his birthday, Teddy said. Where would he go? Candace was surprised. Could it be that George wanted to be alone on his birthday? You can ask Fourth Master. Teddy did not dare to reveal it. When's George's birthday? This Saturday. Teddy said, in three days. Let's plan a birthday surprise for George. Candace made a prompt decision. When Paige heard about the birthday surprise, she was so excited that she agreed immediately. I want to prepare a birthday gift for my brother. I'm afraid George will refuse. Teddy was a little troubled. But I also want to celebrate his birthday with him. After all, he's turning 10 this year. Just because he refuses doesn't mean that we'll back down. Candace was determined. He has rejected me this entire time. Do you see me giving up? 
Teddy was amused by Candace. After spending a month together, Teddy and Candace were much more familiar with each other. Moreover, Teddy found Candace more favorable the more they interacted. At first, he also thought that everything Candace did was to please Fourth Master. However, after interacting with her for a while, he realized that Candace treated George and Paige very well. On top of that, he also seemed to feel a sense of familiarity toward Candace. To George, apart from Edward, Paige, and you, does he have anyone else important in his life? Candace believed that since it was his birthday, the more the merrier. Teddy came back to his senses and quickly replied, he has a good relationship with his godmother, Monica. Upon hearing Monica's name, Candace could not help but smile. It was an existence that warmed her heart. With that, she made a prompt decision. In that case, let's invite Monica. You can also invite young Master Winter and Dr. Jones. Teddy suggested, George doesn't dislike them and they're fourth master's best friends. All right. Candace agreed immediately, but then she thought of something. The rest of the swans don't have a good relationship with George? Not really, Teddy said bluntly, because George's mother and the others from the swans. Teddy suddenly stopped because he had mentioned George's mother. Candace did not care much about those things, so she took the initiative to ask, what kind of person was George's mother? Teddy looked at her. I just want to know more so that I can get to know George better. Candace said, to me, Jean is a thing of the past. After all, she's already gone. Even if I'm jealous of someone, I won't be jealous of her. When Teddy heard Candace, he said, she was a very powerful person. Powerful? Yes, powerful. Teddy nodded. She and Fourth Mazer were evenly matched. When two of them were together, neither of them overshadowed the other. Did Edward love her very much? Candace could not help but ask. Just from Teddy's short comment, she could tell that Teddy approved of Jean. After all, anyone who could be evenly matched with Edward was definitely no ordinary person. Teddy hesitated, but he nodded in the end. She was Fourth Master's first love. They seemed to have had George quite early on. Candace had also learned a little about Edward's love history. When Ms. Lawrence was 18 and Fourth Master was 22. I wasn't even here yet, Teddy said. Why did they split up? There seemed to have been a lot of misunderstandings. Teddy was not too sure either. However, after Ms. Lawrence returned to Southampton City at the age of 25 and married Fourth Master, their relationship was great. Candace nodded. She did not need Teddy to tell her what happened after that. Due to political reasons, Edward and Jean had no choice but to separate, and Jean died in that political dispute. Where's Susan? Candace asked. She asked about Edward's second wife, Paige's biological mother. Her? Teddy was stunned and said bluntly, Fourth Master didn't love her. I know. Candace nodded. But I'm just a little curious. How did Edward and Susan? Candace did not continue her sentence. Instead, she just glanced at the innocent page in her arms. Initially, she did not question the idea that Edward and Susan had a child because of political reasons. However, after interacting with him for a long time, she did not think that Edward was such a person. Edward would not do things that went against his conscience for political reasons, and no matter how she looked at it, she did not think that Paige was a product of politics. If she were, Edward would not love Paige so much. Oh, no. Teddy understood what Candace was talking about and quickly denied it. She's not Ms. Williams. Stunned, Candace looked straight at Teddy. She was not? In that case, Teddy suddenly felt like he had said something wrong. However, by the time he realized it, it was too late. He asked Candace with a trembling voice, don't you know? He did not hide anything from Candace or even guard against her because he thought that Candace already knew. After all, the people closest to Fourth Master knew that Paige was Jean's child. Since Fourth Master and Madam had such a good relationship now, he assumed that Fourth Master had told her. Now that he realized that he had spilled the beans, he wanted to slam his head against the wall and kill himself. Had he made a big mistake? Is she Jean's? Candace did not answer Teddy's question. Instead, she asked what she was thinking. At that point, Teddy did not dare to say anything anymore. Didn't Jean die in that fire? Candace did not need Teddy's answer to confirm what she suspected. That was why Edward loved Paige so much. Paige was the child that Edward and Jean had after they got together, so no matter what, it would mean a lot to Edward. Teddy would rather die than say anything. Could it be that Jean isn't dead? Candace was shocked. In fact, she was using words to provoke Teddy so that he would tell her the truth. When Teddy heard what Candace said, he was indeed shocked. However, he quickly denied, Jean is dead. 
she died giving birth to. Teddy bit his lips. After saying it out loud, he seemed to realize that he had been tricked again. When he saw Candace looking like she finally understood what had happened, he really wanted to kill himself. He could even imagine how Fourth Master would beat him to death if he found out that he had divulged so much today. Candace fell silent at that moment. Therefore, Jean's death was not in that fire. Jean's death was due to childbirth, and that was when she gave birth to Paige. In other words, there was nothing between Susan and Edward. It was just for show, and his goal should have been to protect Jean. After all, at that time, Jean's identity was somewhat illegitimate. Moreover, Jean and Edward were probably enemies. Jean was from the Sanders, and Edward was from the Duncans. With such an identity, even if they let go of everything, it was impossible for them to be together without any grudges. More importantly, the Duncan's loyal followers would not allow Jean's existence. Hence, Edward could only hide Jean. She also realized that when Jean was pregnant with Paige, Jean could not even leave the house. After all, Jean was already dead to the public. Suddenly, Candace felt a sudden pain in her heart. It was as if she had experienced it before and she empathized with Jean. She clutched her chest as an indescribable feeling overwhelmed her. Was it because of jealousy? Was she jealous that Edward had only ever loved Jean? There was no such thing as an affair when Jean was the only woman he loved. If Jean had not died, she would probably never be in Edward's life. Madam. Teddy looked at Candace and said awkwardly, Can you don't tell Fourth Master that I've told you so much? I'm afraid. All right, Candace agreed immediately. Of course, she would not betray Teddy. Since Edward did not mention that Paige was Jean's daughter, she would pretend that she did not know. However, she still hoped that Edward would be honest with her about it one day. What about George's birthday? Teddy asked. I'll plan it, and you can help. All right. Teddy quickly nodded. Candace also decided to focus on George's birthday preparations. As for Edward and Jean's past, it was all in the past. After breakfast, Candace continued to play with Paige for a while. When Paige's tutor came to class, Candace took the initiative to send Edward a message, wanting to discuss George's matter with him. However, she was afraid of disturbing him at work, so she sent him a message to ask if he was busy. After she sent that message, Edward called. Did you miss me? Candace blushed. Were there not a lot of people around him? What would the people around him think of him if he said that? What would they think of her? She controlled her emotions. I just heard from Teddy that George's birthday is this Saturday. There seemed to be a pause for a few seconds, which meant that he must have forgotten. At that moment, Candace was a little displeased because it was clear that Edward did not care about George. George won't be celebrating his birthday at home, Edward said bluntly. The silence just now was not because he had forgotten, but because he was looking at the time to go to the training base. At that time of the year, George would go there alone. In fact, ever since he took office, George's training was not as harsh anymore. For a politician, his physical condition was secondary, and it was fine as long as he was better than average. The most important thing was his ability to plan strategies. Therefore, most of the time was spent on nurturing his overall vision and how to manage a country well. So if he doesn't want to live at home, you're just going to allow him to do that? Candace asked. Edward pursed his lips. He was simply respecting George's choice. George is only ten years old. What do you take him for? Candace was a little angry. Edward was speechless. He believed that it was best for him to satisfy George's needs as much as possible, even though George's needs were very few. I've discussed it with Teddy. We're going to plan a birthday surprise for George, so think of a way not to send George away. Candace was not up for discussing that topic, and her tone was firm. Edward did not reply for a long time. Can't I? Candace was a little nervous. No matter how good her relationship with Edward was recently, he was the leader of the country. Was she pushing her luck? Just as Candace was about to compromise, Edward suddenly said, All right. Candace was stunned. I'm not close enough to George, so I'll leave everything to you in the future. Edward sounded a little excited. She realized that she did not understand Edward that well. However, now that Edward had agreed, she was excited. She said, I'll invite Knox, Finn, and Monica to celebrate George's birthday together. Is that okay? Sure. Edward agreed. Let's not tell George yet. I want to give him a surprise. All right. Edward nodded. In that case, it's settled. I'll plan it. Thank you. Candace hung up the phone happily. After hanging up the phone, she called Monica. Monica was sitting in her office, and when she saw the incoming call, she was still a little surprised. 
How long had it been since she last contacted Candace? Why was she suddenly looking for her? She frowned and answered the call. Candace? Yes, it's me, Monica. The person on the other end sounded much friendlier than her. Most importantly, she did not feel repulsed at all. She had originally decided not to have any contact with that woman. However, that woman had a magical power that made it difficult for her to resist. What's up? Monica's expression was cold. George's birthday is this Saturday, Candace said bluntly. She just did not feel like she had to be too polite with Monica. At that moment, Monica seemed to realize what was going on. She had almost forgotten because George had not celebrated his birthday in the past two years. He was not even in Southampton City on his birthdays, so she could not celebrate with him. Are you free on Saturday? Candace asked. Are you going to celebrate George's birthday with him? That's right. George doesn't spend his birthdays in Southampton City. I've already spoken to Edward to keep George here this time. All right. Monica immediately agreed. George was her godson, so she definitely had to go. I want to give George a surprise. Candace asked, do you have any ideas as to how we can do that? I really don't know how to answer your sudden question. Let me think about it. Okay, but if you do have some good ideas, you must let me know. Yes. Monica nodded. Then, she thought of something and said, George is a little stubborn. Candace was stunned. George still hasn't let go of Jean after so many years, and he probably doesn't celebrate his birthday because he doesn't want to think of Jean. I'm worried that we'll make things worse if we want to celebrate his birthday without telling him beforehand. But George can't stay like this forever. He will have to get over it one day. Candace did not think much of it. Of course, I support your decision, but I just want you to be mentally prepared. Monica was not stupid to know that Candace wanted to celebrate George's birthday to gain his approval. However, what she was worried about was that George would not only not approve of it but would also dislike her even more. After all, no one could change Jean's place in George's heart. Don't worry. I have a strong mind. Candace smiled and said, I won't disturb you from your work. I'll go online and see if there are any good ideas that I can use as a reference. Okay. After they hung up the phone, Monica was also thinking about how they could surprise George and what birthday present she should prepare for him. However, George seemed to have everything he wanted. While she was lost in thought, someone knocked on the door. Monica responded, Come in. Chairman, your flowers. Tim walked in with a bouquet of flowers. It had been a month since she broke up with Finn, but she still received flowers every day. Even though she had rejected them every time, Tim would still bring them in, and she was starting to get a little scared of them. She was a little angry at Tim. I said I don't want them. Why are you bringing it in? Uh, Tim felt a little awkward after being scolded. Is there something you can't say? Monica frowned. She, too, knew that Tim would not ignore her instructions. Dr. Jiang sent it over personally, Tim said. Monica was stunned. I really can't refuse Dr. Jones, so. Monica did not expect to hear that Finn personally delivered it. Was he not usually very busy? Why did he have so much time now to deliver the flowers personally? The key was to send it every day at 10 a.m. in the morning, and Finn should be busy at the hospital. She looked at Tim, who was a little embarrassed, and held herself back. Put it down. Yes. Tim heaved a sigh of relief and left. Monica glanced at the fresh flowers in front of her and picked up her phone to send a message to Finn. When she opened their chat, she saw that Finn had sent her a lot of messages in the past month. He had probably said everything he wanted to say in this lifetime, yet Monica did not look at it or reply to him. She initially wanted to block Finn's number, but after thinking about it, Finn was her father's attending doctor, after all. If anything happened, they would not be able to contact each other. However, because of Monica's coldness toward him, Finn went from sending long text messages at the start to only sending one or two sentences a day. Today's text was even simpler. Only a good morning message was sent at 7.30 a.m., so she figured Finn's enthusiasm would probably die down soon. With that, she typed into the dialogue box. How much were the flowers? I'll pay you back. How much were the flowers? I'll pay you back. Finn looked at Monica's reply and stared at it. That was the first time Monica had replied to him in a month. Although the content was not great, it made him excited. At least, Monica was reacting to everything he did, and everything he did could still affect her. It proved that being annoying could be a good thing too. He was afraid that she would feel nothing for him, no expectation or even resentment. After a long time, he typed a few words in the chat box. This is for you. You don't have to pay me back. 
The other party replied very quickly, I don't need you to send me flowers. From tomorrow onwards, I will also get my secretary to reject your flowers. Please don't make things difficult for my secretary. Finn looked at the text Monica sent, which was a little hurtful, and wondered if it was the same for Monica in the past. Was she also hurt by his indifference toward her when she was pursuing him? In the past month, he had truly felt how hurtful it can be. Ever since Monica and Brandon left that day, Monica had been ignoring him. No matter how he texted her to explain his past thoughts or how he insisted on sending her flowers every day, she remained indifferent and even pretended not to know. He had a feeling that Monica would ignore him every time he sent her a message, but the text gave him hope. Even if she hated him, Monica was not completely indifferent to him. Yet, at that moment, Monica's cold rejection made him a little flustered again. He may have never pursued a woman before, but deep down, he had always felt that it was not difficult to woo women. Perhaps he had always had suitors around him, so he subconsciously felt superior. Now, all his efforts were wasted on Monica. He looked at the text on his phone and did not reply for a long time as he did not know how to reply. Seeing that Finn did not reply, Monica did not take it to heart. When it came to breaking up with Finn, she was much more carefree than she had imagined. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door. Come in. Brandon pushed the door open and entered. The first thing he saw was the dazzling bouquet of flowers. Monica seemed to have noticed Brandon's gaze. She said, if you like it, you can take it away. Brandon smiled. Finn hasn't given up yet? I don't know. He has exceeded my expectations. I didn't think he would be so persistent. Me, too. Monica agreed. It seems that he really can't let go of you. No, he just can't let go of himself. Monica was certain. He has been entangled with me for so many years that he just can't figure it out at the moment. If Finn really changed for you, would you return to his side? Finn won't change. What if? There are no ifs, Monica said, setting up a huge wall in her heart. I won't try again. To put it bluntly, Monica did not believe that Finn would really change. Just as Brandon wanted to say something, Monica directly interrupted him, it's working hours. Do you have too much free time on your hands? Brandon swallowed the words he was about to say. Then, he changed the topic and reported his work. The development of the new product has been successful, and it will soon be available on the market. Before this, you mentioned that you wanted to go abroad to learn about the market's operating concept. So, I've contacted the world's most famous S group, and they said they'll welcome us next week. Next Monday? Monica asked. Yes, next Monday. Okay. Book the plane tickets and plan the itinerary in advance. We'll leave on Sunday. The flight will take about eight hours, so I suggest we leave on Saturday. Then, we can still have some time to rest on Sunday. Otherwise, it'll be very tiring on Monday. Moreover, if we don't adapt to the weather there, I'm afraid it will affect the outcome of the visit. Monica thought for a moment and said, let's leave on Saturday night. Are you busy on Saturday? Brandon was smart enough to figure it out immediately. I have something very important on Saturday. Book a flight for after 10 p.m., Monica said. It should be fine after 10 p.m. All right. Brandon naturally did not probe further. He said, your secretary, Tim, and I will accompany you on this business trip. Is that okay? Monica nodded and agreed with Brandon's arrangements. Brandon's lips curled into a smile, even though Monica did not notice it. Is there anything else? Monica frowned when she saw that Brandon had not left. There's a dinner party tonight. The pharmaceutical company from Europe has invited you to dinner, so it's up to you whether you want to attend or reject the invite. Hasn't he invited me many times now? Yes, and you've rejected him many times, Brandon said bluntly. I don't have anything on tonight, so I'll go. All right. Brandon said, I will just be him and his assistant from his side, and from ours. It'll just be the two of us. Also, give them a heads up that they should act within their means with the alcohol. Yes. Having reported his work, Brandon was prepared to leave. The moment he left, he paused again and said, if you don't like this bouquet of flowers, you can give it to me. Monica frowned and looked at Brandon. As your subordinate, I'm willing to share your problems. Monica smiled. Brandon had been behaving himself for the past month. Even after she rejected him, he did not pester her anymore. Their interaction this month was purely for work. It made her feel that Brandon was a trustworthy person, and naturally, she had a good impression of him. It was not a romantic relationship, but she found that interacting with Brandon was very easy and relaxing. That feeling was completely different from when she was with Finn. She said, take it. All right. 
Brandon happily carried the bouquet of red roses away and placed them in his office. He looked at them and thought they looked pretty. Finn must have put in a lot of effort. However, it was all too late. He now believed that Monica had no feelings for Finn. With that, Brandon took out his phone and took a few photos of the flowers. Then, he typed a Facebook post, which said, Thank you for your commendation, Chairman. I will work harder. He also attached a photo to the post. He was sure that if Finn saw it, Finn would be furious. On one hand, the post was to make Finn give up on Monica completely, and on the other, it was to take revenge on Finn for hurting and bullying Monica to the point that she was afraid of falling in love. After he sent it, he contacted paid Facebook to boost his traffic on the post because he wanted Finn to see it, and Finn did see it. That was because he had quite some spare time recently, and when he had nothing to do, he would read a lot of things on his phone. That was when he was caught off guard BT Brandon's Facebook post. He looked at the bouquet of flowers. He had wrapped it himself, so he knew it was the bouquet he had given Monica. At that, his expression turned ugly. He thought that Monica would throw it away. However, he did not expect Monica would turn around and give it to another man, who was Brandon. Suddenly, his phone rang, so Finn tried his best to calm himself down. He picked up the call. Knox. What's wrong? Are you in a bad mood? Knox could tell the change in Finn's mood from their years of interaction. What's the matter? Finn did not answer, but his tone was unusually cold. Knox did not even need to think to know that Finn must have suffered a lot of humiliation while pursuing Monica. Initially, he felt sorry for Finn. After all, Finn had loved Monica for so many years, yet Monica left the relationship just like that. However, for some reason, he felt good at that moment. Making a man like Finn, who had never changed and was always calm, anxious was not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes, he felt that Finn was too rational and lacked a bit of humanity. It was as if he was a zombie and only lived for the sake of living. At that thought, Knox realized that Monica was very patient to have been able to be in a relationship with Finn for so many years. George's birthday is on Sunday. Edward just called me and said that he's going to Zhuqing Garden on Sunday to celebrate George's birthday. Isn't George usually not at home for his birthday? Finn was surprised. I heard it was Candace's idea, Knox said, still feeling a little upset. That woman is quite capable, and I think Edward has really fallen in love with her. She is the second woman Edward has fallen in love with after Jean. After so many years, I thought that Edward would never fall in love again. Finn was not surprised. Knox mumbled, I didn't realize how capable Candace was. Not only is she not as pretty as Jean, but she's only married to Edward for political reasons, so how did Edward fall in love with her? Back then, Susan was really in love with Edward, but he didn't even glance at her before sending her back to Alex's side. From then, I thought Edward would be alone for the rest of his life. As usual, Finn just listened without giving any explanation. Don't you find it strange? Knox was bored of being the only one talking. He knew that a man like Finn needed to be taught a lesson. If Finn was not interested in anything, what was the point of living? It was time Monica woke him up. You'll know why Fourth Master likes Candace so much in the future. Did Edward say something to you? Knox got excited. He could not believe that Edward told Finn but not him. You don't need to know. Finn. Knox gritted his teeth. That guy was just so annoying sometimes. Is there anything else? Finn was very calm about Knox's displeasure with him. Is your relationship with Monica better? Knox asked. Finn did not answer, and not answering meant that it was not good. Knox gloated, Finn, you have to pay for what you've done. Beware of Monica cheating on you. Finn's expression turned ugly, and he abruptly hung up the call. The small victory put Knox in a good mood. At that moment, someone knocked on the office door. Come in. Knox's secretary, Ms. Mary walked in and reported respectfully, General Manager, I've made an appointment with the Wenda Group to visit their resort development project. We have to go to the site for inspection now, and your car is ready. Knox nodded. With that, he got up and left the company with his secretary. He did not know when it started, but all of the Swan's businesses had fallen on him to manage. Initially, when Edward took office, he was focusing solely on developing his political career and could not spare any energy for business at all. Hence, Knox had to take over the business side of things. It was really tough back then, but now, everything was finally back on track. There was not much pressure anymore, and he did not need to spend a lot of time on the business. However, he still felt physically and mentally exhausted. He had always thought that once the country's politics had smoothened out, 
he, Edward, and Finn would no longer have to shoulder any responsibilities and could live their own lives. However, it was all wishful thinking. When the country was at peace, they had greater responsibilities. Knox turned around and saw the car had parked in the largest sea area in Southampton City. Then, he took a yacht to an island that had yet to be fully developed as he needed to see the results of the second stage of development today. When the yacht arrived on the island, there were people welcoming them warmly. As Knox was used to being welcomed, he exchanged a few pleasantries with Danny Cruzzi, the general manager of Wenda Group, who then showed him around respectfully. In the past, Danny had heard that Knox was sloppy and unreliable. However, after interacting with Knox twice, he realized that the rumors were false. In terms of work, Knox was even more demanding than ordinary people, and after he was humiliated last time, he did not dare to be negligent this time. Knox's expression was very serious as he listened to Danny's report and looked around. He could see that the development progress this time was much better than the last time. The last time, they cut corners, and he almost directly banned Wenda Group's construction rights. By the time Knox did a tour of the place and pointed out the parts that were not perfect, it was time to eat. Knox did not refuse to eat at the only high-class restaurant on the island as it was also considered part of the project. Only Knox and Danny were at the table while everyone else who did not have the right to sit at the table stood at the side. From afar, Knox looked very noble. That was probably the Knox that Shelley had never seen before. In her memories, Knox was simply unbearable, so she almost could not recognize the serious-looking man in a suit and leather shoes at that moment. She stood quietly in the crowd and watched Knox and Danny eat elegantly. In fact, from the moment Knox arrived, she had been standing behind him. However, Knox did not recognize her and probably would not. Tell me about the restaurant. Knox put down her knife and fork seriously. If Shelley had not seen it with her own eyes, she could never imagine that Knox would be like that at work. Attracted by his aura, everyone looked at Knox. Firstly, this is the most high-class restaurant on the island. We've injected a lot of cultural ideas into the island, but I don't see the embodiment of these cultures in the restaurant. In fact, this place makes me feel no different than being in all the other high-class restaurants in Southampton City. Secondly, there's nothing special about the food here. Although the taste is all right, it doesn't feel like a local specialty and won't leave a deep impression on people. Even if you want to promote it, you won't be able to create the hype. Thirdly, I don't recommend the staff here to wear formal attire. People come here to relax, and being too formal will make people feel depressed. At least, I don't feel like I'm coming to the island to relax. Those comments made Danny sweat profusely, but he quickly agreed. All right. We'll change it again. The trial opening is on the 16th of next month. I don't want to see anything that I'm not satisfied with on that day, Knox said coldly. All right, all right. I will do everything perfectly. Danny was practically trying to curry favor. Knox wiped his lips and got up from the dining table. Then, he said bluntly, arrange a tour guide for me. Yes. Danny gave the staff member beside him a look. Shelley walked out. When she first applied to be a tour guide here, she did not know that the Winter Enterprise was involved in the development of that place. All she saw at that time was the high-paying job in the recruitment advertisement. She just wanted to give it a try but did not expect to be hired. After she was accepted, she had to go through a period of intense training. Today, the first tour guide she received was to take the big boss on a tour of the entire island, but she did not expect the boss to be Knox. If she had known, she might have gotten someone else to do it. It had been so many years, and she had never thought that she would have anything to do with Knox again. She braced herself and walked up to Knox. Hello, Mr. Winter. I'm your personal tour guide today, and you can call me Irene. It was just a random name that she had thought of. Knox glanced at Shelley and did not pay much attention to her. He strode in front and said to the others, you don't have to come with us. It meant that other than the tour guide, no one else should follow. With that, Shelley followed Knox out. She took a deep breath and began to explain, Hello, Mr. Winter. Welcome to Kylan Island. The reason why this island is called Kylan is mainly because of the overall shape of the island. You can look straight ahead now, and right in front of you is the head of the Kylan on the island. If you look carefully, there's an arc-shaped shape at the end of the sea. That's the Kylan's eye. We call it the window of the world. Shelley, Knox suddenly called out to her. Shelley suddenly stopped talking. In the end, he still recognized her. She pursed her lips and looked at Knox, who was also looking at her from above. The two of them just stared at each other, but
but Shelley did not feel inferior because of his imposing presence. Why are you here as a tour guide? Knox asked, aren't you in school? No, Shelley replied. Knox's eyes widened in disbelief when he heard the answer. I haven't been to school since I graduated from high school, Shelley said bluntly. Why not? Knox was surprised. I couldn't take the college entrance examination, so I stopped. Didn't I tell you to take the college entrance examination in the second year? I lost interest in the second year. Shelley, what are you doing? Knox suddenly became annoyed. Don't worry, I don't blame you. It was my choice. Your choice? What? Do you think you're so great just because you've changed your appearance? Knox's eyes were red at that moment. He was clearly a little angry. Shelley pursed her lips tightly. Yes, she had plastic surgery on her eyes, nose, and even her lower jaw. In short, she had done something to her face. If it were not someone familiar with her, they probably would not be able to recognize her. That was why she thought that Knox would not be able to recognize her. Why do you need plastic surgery? Knox asked her. Every woman has the right to look beautiful, so why can't I? So, you took the money I gave you and did this instead of going to school? Knox asked her coldly. Yes. Shelley nodded. It's so ugly. Knox said in disgust, you look uglier than your original face. Everyone has a different level of appreciation. Shelley appeared very calm. And I quite like it. All men hate women who have gone under the knife. Knox said fiercely. I didn't do it to make you like me. Besides, Shelley swallowed the words she was about to say. After all, Zoe had also gone under the knife, but she did not think it was necessary for her to sow discord between them. However, Zoe's plastic surgery was quite successful. If she had not bumped into Zoe when she went to the plastic surgery hospital for a follow-up, she would not have noticed that Zoe had done so much to her face. She said, I'm here for work now, so please cooperate with me. I'm here to check on work. Why should I cooperate with you? Knox was very aggressive, and his bad temper was showing. Shelley could not understand it. They had not seen each other for a few years, but why were they still quarreling when they met? Was he only gentle and patient to Zoe and no one else? I just hope you don't mix up your personal feelings with work. I'm the boss. Do I need you to teach me how to do things? Shelley felt that she could not communicate with Knox. Therefore, it was a wise choice for her to leave the winters back then. She said, if you don't want me to be your tour guide, I can immediately get someone else to take you around. I don't want my personal reasons to affect your acceptance of this project. With that, Shelley turned around and left. She did not want to waste her breath on Knox as she thought it was useless. Just as she walked away, Knox grabbed Shelley's arm. Shelley winced and endured it. Do your work. Knox ordered. Did that mean Knox wanted her to continue? She pursed her lips. Although she was a little surprised, she did not think there was anything to be surprised about. No matter what Knox did, he never did things according to common sense. Shelley took a deep breath and smiled professionally. Mr. Winter, this way please. Knox glanced at Shelley, waved his hand, and walked in front angrily. Seeing that, Shelley followed behind. As Knox walked, Shelley kept talking. To be honest, Shelley did not even know if Knox heard her. In any case, she had told him everything she was trained to do on a tour. Whether Knox was satisfied or not, she did not care since she had tried her best. At worst, Knox would complain about her, and she would be fired. With that thought in mind, she walked around the island with Knox. It took them more than two hours to return to the starting point, where everyone was waiting for them. Seeing Knox return with a dark face, Danny was frightened again. He quickly looked at Shelley. Shelley, on the other hand, did not know what kind of look she should give her boss. In fact, she felt that she should be praying for herself. When Danny saw Shelley's gaze, a chill ran down his back. He trembled as he asked, Mr. Winter, look dash. Her professionalism is not bad, Knox said bluntly. When he said that, Shelley was shocked because she thought Knox did not even hear what she said. But her image won't do, Knox said coldly. Shelley knew that she could not expect anything from Knox. Danny smiled awkwardly. At that moment, he could not help but retort in a low voice, Shelley's image is not bad. She's considered the best guide among us. Knox looked over, and Danny stopped talking. Knox said without any hesitation, is an artificial face good-looking? Stunned, Danny could not help but glance at Shelley. In fact, everyone looked at Shelley, who felt a little embarrassed. Of course, she did not deliberately hide that she had undergone plastic surgery, but she did not go so far as to tell everyone that she had undergone plastic surgery either. 
now that it was said in public, it would still be a little embarrassing. Um, Danny said, ordinary people wouldn't be able to tell. Shelley's face looked so natural that even I couldn't tell. I could. Knox was being unreasonable. Danny really did not know what to say. He felt that Knox was deliberately making things difficult for him by nitpicking on things. But Shelley is the best tour guide in terms of looks and professionalism, Danny really did not want to fire her. So are all your tour guides this standard? There's no need to make things difficult for my boss. Shelley could not stand it anymore. She said, I didn't meet Mr. Winter's requirements, so I'll resign. I didn't meet Mr. Winter's requirements, so I'll resign, Shelley said frankly. She knew Knox too well, and Knox had never made things easy for her. She figured it was her fault for being brought back to the Winters, and that was why Knox had been trying to take revenge on her and torture her all these years. When Knox heard Shelley's words, he still felt disgusted. Shelley never seemed to show him any weakness, and it was the same in the past. Although he had always forced her to do many things, he could tell that she was unwilling to do them. On top of that, she never knew how to please him, not that she could please him anyway. His dislike for her was deep-rooted. He even knew very well that he was deliberately targeting her today. However, so what if he was targeting her? She used the money he gave her for studies on plastic surgery. When he saw Shelley's unrecognizable face, he was furious. Danny chose to remain silent when he heard what Shelley said, even though he thought it was a pity. In that case, I'll take my leave. Shelley bowed politely. Then, she turned around and left without waiting for anyone to agree. She was very calm and composed, as if she would not miss the job. In reality, Shelley had put a lot of effort into the job. After all, a tour guide would have more freedom in terms of time, and she would not have to leave early and return late like her current part-time job. Forget it. She did not have much expectations for Knox anyway. Just like that, Shelley left under everyone's watchful eyes. It was as if she was not fired by the boss, but she was firing the boss. Looking at her back, Knox's expression turned even uglier. Danny did not even dare to breathe loudly. After interacting with Knox a few times, he knew that Knox was difficult to deal with. The atmosphere was tense and awkward. Knox said coldly, I'm not satisfied with the inspection this time. I'll come back and check on you again in a week. If the inspection fails, the trial opening will be postponed indefinitely. Danny felt helpless. What the hell did he do wrong? How much did young Master Winter hate girls with plastic surgery? It was too difficult for him to find a completely natural one in this day and age. After saying that, Knox left in the speedboat he came. From afar, he saw a speedboat that had left arriving at the shore. Knox's expression was extremely ugly. He had not seen Shelley for so many years, yet that woman still made him inexplicably angry. In the future, it was best they did not see each other again. Knox calmed himself down for a few seconds before he took out her phone and dialed a number. Zoe. He really wanted to find someone to calm himself down. Why are you calling me at this hour? What's wrong? Did you miss me? The voice on the other end was gentle. How did you know that I was thinking about you too? The coldness on Knox's face gradually softened. Let's have dinner together tonight. Tonight? What's the matter? Knox raised his eyebrows. I have a company dinner tonight. As the leader of my department, I can't miss it. The other party was in a difficult position. Knox's expression darkened even more. He hated being rejected the most. Can I come over to your place after dinner tonight? Don't be angry. Zoe tried to please him. I'll be yours for the entire night, okay? Knox obviously knew what Zoe was talking about. He and Zoe had been dating for the sake of marriage, so they had slept together very early on. Although they were not officially living together, they would spend a night together from time to time. At that thought, it crossed his mind that he had not done it with Zoe for a few days. He did not know when he had started to get used to having sex once every few days with a woman, but he refused to admit that he was old. He said, all right. It turned out he was really at the age where he would not be too willful. When you're home tonight, wash up and wait for me. Zoe used her gentle voice to say something bold. Knox smiled faintly. However, because there were people around, he could not say anything flirty. Hence, he said, I'll wait for you. Of course, Zoe was smart enough to know that Knox was not alone and that was why he did not say much. The call between the two ended very quickly. After it ended, Zoe's expression changed slightly. It was not that she did not like Knox. Knox was the man she loved the most out of all the men she had met over the years. However, she had been playing around for so many years that it was difficult for her to give up being a playgirl and be loyal to Knox. 
she would give herself another year, and a year later she would immediately pull herself together to be a good wife to Knox. With that thought in mind, she looked down at the WhatsApp message on the screen. 6 p.m. I'll see you at our usual spot. That was right. She had lied to Knox. What company dinner? She just had another date with a man. After being rejected by Zoe, Knox felt upset. In fact, Zoe would not always agree to eat with him. Sometimes, she would even say no to going to his house. However, he was inexplicably annoyed today. He thought about it and called Finn. Let's have dinner together tonight. Finn had yet to answer when Knox suddenly raised his voice. Don't reject me. Finn frowned. I never thought of rejecting you. He did not have much to do these days. The only thing he had to do was to get Monica back. I'll give you the address. Knox said, 6 p.m., don't be late. All right, Finn replied. He put down his phone and sat on the sofa. For the entire day, his mind had been filled with what Brandon was bragging about on the Facebook post. After thinking about it for an entire day, he still could not get it out of his mind. He could not help but imagine the scene of Monica and Brandon. He really wanted to drown his sorrows in alcohol. Therefore, he arrived at the restaurant Knox mentioned at 6 p.m. sharp. Under the guidance of the staff, he sat in the private room and waited for Knox. He was used to Knox being late. Knox always reminded others to be punctual, but he had never been punctual. Half an hour later, Knox pushed open the door and walked in. When he looked at Finn, he did not look apologetic at all. Instead, he said, I'm a working man, and you're jobless. Finn did not care about Knox being late, so why was Knox giving him a reason? By the way, did you really resign from the hospital? Knox still could not believe it. Finn was a responsible man. They had known each other for so many years, and he knew Finn all too well. He even had a feeling that Finn would devote his entire life to the medical industry not because he was a kind person, but because he was a little too cold-blooded. That was why he could be so numb to doing some seemingly great things that made him feel like living in this world was not meaningless. Yes. Finn nodded. For Monica, you've really changed a lot. Knox could not help but sigh. Most importantly, Monica doesn't appreciate it at all. Finn was speechless. He did not come to have dinner with Knox just for Knox to attack him. He said bluntly, do you still want to eat dinner together? Can't I say something? Bro, I'm just concerned about you. You should worry about yourself. You're not young anymore, and you've been dating Zoe for so long. Don't you plan to get married? Do you not want your grandfather to have a great-grandson? I don't know why, but after dating for so long, I really don't have any thoughts of getting married. I originally wanted to get married, but I really can't bring myself to do it. Knox suddenly felt a little melancholic. Maybe you don't like Zoe. How is that possible? Knox looked at Finn in disbelief. You just think that Zoe is the one you want as your wife, Finn said bluntly. Even so, it's fine. After all, Zoe is the only person who has made me think of getting married after so many years. In that case, why don't you get married? Knox was speechless. Zoe isn't the only one who makes you think you want to get married. Zoe just met you at the right time when your grandfather and your parents stopped forcing you. Finn hit the nail on the head. Knox was exasperated. Why did Finn have to expose him like that? He said, I don't deny that I've thought of that, but after so long, Zoe and I are still dating. To me, she's still different. Why don't you say you've reached the age where you want to settle down? Finn. Knox was a little angry. Your relationship is a mess. What right do you have to judge my relationship? 